Okay, it's uh, one o'clock and I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's December 7th, 2022 uh, board hearing. Um, today we have uh, staff analysis and preliminary recommendations relating to the fiscal year 2023 one care Vermont budget and certification. Um, we have minutes from uh, our Monday hearing down in Rutland on December 5th. Uh, I'm going to put those off um, till next week because I have not yet myself read them. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Rutland community. As you uh, said, we were there on Monday. We had a very robust uh, day in the community, and I want to thank all those that prepared and shared um, their their uh, experiences with us that day. I look forward to planning more uh, visits for traveling board meetings to other communities in the near future. Additionally, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board had our Data Governance Council meeting yesterday. At that meeting, board member Jessica Holmes was appointed as the board member on the council. She is filling the vacancy left uh, when board member uh, Tom Pelham retired earlier this fall. As a reminder, and for folks uh, who may not know, the, the DGC or the Data Governance Council serves several functions, and it's the Data Governance um, Stewardship Council for the board and uh, those data sets that the board is um, responsible for are VCURES, which is our claims data, and VUDS, which is our hospital discharge data set. At our meeting yesterday, we reviewed two requests for uh, de-identified data for two research projects. All of the information regarding those requests and information on the Data Governance Council can be found on our website under our data and analytics section. Uh, there are several special public comment periods that are open. Uh, as a reminder, the board is currently reviewing the five-year comprehensive um, 2023 to 2027 Vermont Health Information Strategic Plan and Connectivity Criteria for 2023. Please submit any of your public comments regarding this plan to be considered ahead of the staff presentation and potential vote on that for next week. In addition, we are accepting public comments on the FY23 One Care budget. You will hear more about that from our staff immediately after I finish. And then last but certainly not least, we have an ongoing public comment period for anyone interested in sharing their, their comments regarding a next potential model between the state of Vermont and CMMI. Any of those comments, uh, we will share with AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a next potential all-payer model with the federal government. With that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you very much. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to our team uh, who's been working weekends, late nights, early mornings, all sorts of uh, time getting this ready for everybody. Um, and I'll let you all introduce yourselves uh, as you'd like. Um, please go ahead, thank you. Hi all, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health Systems Policy at the board. Um, I am just going to introduce our staff team as we prepare to present you with our analysis and preliminary recommendations on OneCare's FY23 uh, budget and certification. Um, so as as in past years, um, the Green Mountain Care Board staff has pulled together an interdisciplinary team um, to perform this analysis uh, and, and present it to you today. Um, this is really a review um, based on the statute and, and, and all of the requirements that requires um, really broad expertise. So we bring together our policy team to look at payment and care models and intersection with the all payer model. We bring in our finance team to look at the financial analysis and intersection with hospital regulation. Um, we uh, review results and evaluation and data systems with our data team and our legal team uh, works with us on compliance with the statute and rule. So um, all that said, uh, there will be quite a few of us presenting today. In addition to myself, we'll have Marissa Melamed, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, Jennifer DiPolito, uh, our health policy analyst on our policy team, 
Russ McCracken, staff attorney, Matt Sutter, Health Systems Finance's prin principal analyst, uh, and Michelle Degree, uh, Health Policy Project Director. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out um, to all of the others uh, on the GMCB team who have had a huge part in developing this analysis. Uh, Michelle Sawyer, Sawyer, Sarah Lindbergh, Flora Pagan, uh, Lindsay Kill, Julia Bowles, um, and others as well. Uh, and we may call on them to help us answer questions or dig deeper into areas of board interest as they come up during your discussion. Um, so thank you for, for hearing that. And with that said, I will pass it on to Marissa. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board and the public. My name is Marissa Melamed, Associate Director of Health Systems Policy. Our agenda for today is we are going to give you an introduction and background uh, and an overview of public comment received to date. We're going to walk you through our FY23 staff analysis and preliminary recommendations or approach to this year's budget review. We'll talk you through the next steps in this process. Uh, then turn it over for board questions and discussion and public comment. Um, and the key areas of review we're going to go through are in that call out box. So briefly, um, the ACO oversight statute and rule, we gave you an introductory presentation on October 12th. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just a reminder that there are two processes that uh, the One Care Vermont ACO is subject to certification, um, which is one time with a annual eligibility verification, and then budget review, which is annual um, review and approval or modification. Um, and it's actually a, a bifurcated process. So um, payer contracts are still under negotiation. So this is the expected budget as things stood when it was developed over the summer. Um, we, we actually have the ACO come back in the spring with finalized contracts and present their final budget. And again, a reminder of the standards of review. Um, the statutory criteria are in the reference slides at the end of the deck or available online um, if you want to look through those. These are budget uh, specific criteria uh, that I'm showing here. So again, it's um, 18 BSA 9382, GMCB Rule 5, um, and elements of the all-payer ACO model agreement. And specifically, the board considers any benchmarks that are established under Section 5.402. We'll talk about that a little bit. All of the criteria and um, elements of the ACO's payer-specific programs and any applicable requirements of 18 BSA 9551 of the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization model agreement. Uh, and the ACO shall have the burden of justifying its budget to the board. So um, our staff is a very familiar and has gone through a deep review, um, but sometimes there are questions that we need to defer uh, directly to the ACO to have them uh, speak for themselves. Uh, quickly to show you where we are, <coughs> excuse me, in the process. Um, today we're at the staff analysis presentation um, there will be two opportunities for deliberation as needed uh, next Wednesday and December 14th, as well as December 21st, where we will notice a potential vote if the board is ready to do that. The ACO does need its budget established by the end of the calendar year. And then again, in the spring, they come back and present actual budget. A reminder that public comment is accepted throughout the process starting in October. Um, we request that comments be submitted by December 16th so that we have time to review and compile it um, prior to the final recommendations. We have received some um, recent, you know, within the last day or so comments. We have done our best to incorporate those into the slides, um, but we are still still working to incorporate, um, you know, information that came in uh, at the last minute. And the comment period remains open. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jennifer DePaldo to go over an overview of, of public comments received. Thank you, Marissa. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. Great. Uh, so the board has received a total of 19 comments as of December 5th. Um, and like Marissa mentioned, I just want to remind folks again, uh, they can still submit public comment related to One Care's fiscal year 2023 budget submission. Um, and we do ask that you submit by December 16th in order to be considered ahead of the board vote, which we have scheduled tentatively for December 21st. Uh, the board has received comments from a number of stakeholders that identified affiliation, including hospital CEOs, federally qualified health centers, primary care providers, and members of OneCare's board of managers. 
And common themes from these comments include the value of One Care's data analytics, population health initi initiatives, and transition to value-based care, and the value of care coordination and strengthen partnerships with local care organizations. And among the comments received from members of the public who did not indicate any affiliation, the common themes were concerns related to the transition of One Care's data analytics to the UVM Health Network and concerns related to measures of One Care's performance and overall value to Vermont's healthcare system. And you can move ahead. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so um, following One Care's budget hearing on November 9th, One Care's Board of Managers submitted a comment regarding topics that were addressed during the hearing. One Care's Board of Managers sought to clarify how One Care's executive compensation is determined and provide comment on the board's approach to executive compensation in the hearing. The use of the term data breach when referring to the cyber attack that occurred at UVMMC in October 2020. The standards and legal requirements that were considered regarding One Care's new data analytics arrangement with UVM Health Network and the manner in which One Care's operational costs are funded. One Care does state that operational costs are not funded directly through taxpayer dollars, but through hospital participants in One Care's network. The board also received public comment from the healthcare advocate and under statute, the HCA has a right to participate in the board's review of the ACO budget by submitting questions that the board will ask the ACO, submit, submitting written comments to the board and asking questions of board staff and asking questions and providing testimony in any ACO budget hearing. Themes from the HCA include concerns regarding One Care's deepening ties to the University of Vermont Health Network, specifically that it risks undermining the effectiveness of Vermont's all-payer model, and One Care's continued lack of demonstrated benefit to Vermonters in the state. The HCA points to insufficient evidence to support claims that their programs improve population health outcomes, care coordination for Vermonters, or reduce costs. I want to note that One Care submitted a response last night to the HCA's comments, and the response is posted on the board's website for reference. Again, there's still opportunity to submit comment to the board before December 16th uh, to be considered ahead of the board's vote. Thank you so much. I will turn it back to Marissa. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to give uh, a high level overview now of, of the staff analysis and what you're going to hear today. So the high level overview uh sorry this is actually a high level overview of the of the aco's budget in general just to, to ground everyone um i'm going to talk briefly about their provider network payer programs uh their income or financial statements and then our approach to the fy23 staff recommendations so on the provider network the changes to the provider network are minimal this year uh, there, they noted in their uh, narrative some changes, addition of independent primary care, oh sorry, one primary care practice closed through retirement, they've added four skilled nursing facilities, they've increased payer program participation, including one CCR practice, you can see kind of the high level overview of their network there. Um, I will note as we used this figure last year and we had to update it. Um, based on the, the underlying calculations that approximately 82% of Vermont primary care providers do participate in One Care's network, according to um, estimates uh, derived from their roster, um, as well as um, information from the Department of Health uh, Workforce survey data. Um, One Care's participation data is available in the budget submission um, and posted online to so their provider rosters and um, participation by organizations, payer program. Um, but overall, um, the, the, the changes are, are minimal um, this year and um, without putting a quantitative number on it, except for that 82%, there's pretty good um, saturation of their network um, within the system. <clears throat> for payer programs for 23, this is a summary of uh, starting attribution and payer program participation by hospital, just to give you an idea of the of the scope. Again, this comes from attachments A and B of the One Care budget submission, um, and this is to show you um, that we have 14 um, a 14 HSAs participating overall. How many HSAs are participating in each payer program, and then broken out by the type of hospital. Um, so the overall sort of takeaway here is that, you know, there's lower participation in Medicare, um, particularly for uh, the critical access hospitals, um, the, but penetration is uh, 
um, um, higher in the other other programs. So we just broke this out by type of hospital this year. Um, and the, the numbers on the bottom are sort of the overall HSAs and, you know, of seven um, participating critical access hospitals overall, how many are participating in each payer program, same thing for the acute care hospitals, and then the two um, participating academic medical centers, University of Vermont Medical Center and Dartmouth Health. Okay, this is a summary income statement view. So the big numbers in uh, one care submitted budget. We look at the budget in two ways. The full accountability or total cost of care budget information is in purple. The entity level or organizational level budget is orange. So let's take a look at the full accountability budget first. The full accountability submitted budget is the result of provider network participation, negotiated payer program terms, and one care strategies to develop their network payer programs. So the full accountability budget includes healthcare spending for one care attributed lives for total cost of care services process externally to one care. So that's 97%. Um, these are, uh, this is dollars that would be spent on this particular population, um, regardless of, um, you know, regardless of, of one care participation in one care. This represents the amount that's expected to be, to be um, spent on this population. Um, about 2% of that full accountability is population health expenses or dollars that have been diverted to population health payment models or programs. And 1% um, of that represents the administrative expenses um, that it, it takes to uh, run uh, one care and perform all of these functions. The full accountability budget is reviewed and approved by the one care board of managers, um, but one care cannot unilaterally decide contract terms with payers, such as payment models, benchmark trend rates, risk arrangements. Um, many of the factors that contribute to this budget are um, based on negotiated arrangements. The entity level submitted budget is developed at the discretion of one care governance and leadership, meaning it is elements of the budget that are not contractually obligated uh, and are developed through committees made up of the provider network, supported by one care staff and leadership and approved by their board of managers. So all of this happens before the budget comes before the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, revenues that are not contractually obligated with payers include uh, participation fees, a fixed payment allocation, which also comes from hospitals um, as an offset and shared savings distribution, which is set in policy by one care. Um, expenses include population health management investments or a uh, portion of them, administrative expenses and shared losses, if any. Again, this is set in policy. Now you won't see the shared savings or losses in the budget because one care budgets as break even. So they budget to hit their targets exactly. Um, including the advanced shared savings to fund the blueprint, which we will talk about later. Okay, so this is meant to be um, a, a flow chart to help you understand the one care budget in the context of the full landscape of Vermont healthcare spending. So if you start on the same key chart on the left, you have total Vermont resident expenditures from the, it's 2020 data. So first of all, this is very, it looks nice. It's beautiful. It's very back of the envelope though, because we have different years. We have 2020 expenditure numbers and then we have um, one care budget numbers, but I think it's enough to give you, to give you an idea. So on the left, you have Vermont total resident expenditures estimated at 6.4 billion. So first of all, you peel off 56% um, of that are not even under the all payer model. Um, so that's the bottom amount, 44% of that total um, is included in the all payer model to, to, uh, total cost of care. So then you look at that amount um, and off the top, you peel off non one care Vermont. So it's about 51% of that. Um, and the, the next darker green bar is the one care Vermont total cost of care plus population health. Um, so that's about 49% of the all payer model to, total cost of care. And then um, you drill down from there, the one care budget specifically the dark green to the to the two orange, um, you have about 32% um, is um, converted to fixed perspective payments under the different pay arrangements. Um, the rest of it um, is fee for service uh, linked to quality. 
um, and we can we can talk about what that means a little bit. So we put some numbers to that. Um, again, as we as we stated or stated in the previous slide, the total cost of care that's the 1.4 billion, um, and this is the portion of the Vermont total cost of care that one care is accountable for affecting change on. So lowering the rate of growth and improving quality. So that piece that says one care total cost of care that's their, that's their sphere of influence. Um, this is the expected healthcare spending that would be spent on the population of patients absent any intervention. And all of this, um, except for all of this, except for the um, administrative expenses, go directly uh, to providers to pay for care. Um, some of it is contractually obligated, or most of it is contractually obligated. Some of it is at the at the discretion of uh, of one care. Um, 438 million is converted from fee for service to fixed prospective payments in some form. Um, and the rest is converted from fee for service to fee for service <laughs> tied to quality, um, meaning they if they if they don't the payments are lowered if they don't um, hit certain quality targets. Um, and then One Care Vermont population health and admin, their total accountability budget that comes to 45.1 million. Um, 29.9 is in population health payments for providers and is a conversion of funds from hospitals or payers to primary care or community-based providers. So it's, it's um, you know, revenues that may have been paid um, to, to hospitals are sort of being converted into um, to primary care. So it's, it's trying to funnel more, more dollars into primary care payments. 15.2 is administrative, or as uh, one care spoke about it, shared infrastructure um, for administering these payments and programs. Um, one more contextual slide for you here. So um, this uh, donut chart shows you administrative costs. This is to help you contextualize that, that $15 million um, in relation to the total cost of care. Um, administrative costs associated with insurance were 8.3% of total Vermont res resident expenditures in 2020. Um, so insurance administrative costs are, are considerably higher. Now they also do a lot more, but it's just meant to give you um, um, some context on, on what it costs to administer uh, uh, the payments and programs. Um, so um, many of the ACO's expenses are not new, but rather reallocated from payers and hospitals. So it's difficult to gauge how many of their expenses are truly new to the system spending. So some of their functions you know, would be reallocated back to hospitals or insurers um, if they didn't exist. Um, and what we don't have today is a PMPM from payer um, for their care coordination activities. That is something that could be considered for additional um, in, in a rate review to support regulatory alignment. So again, this slide is, is contextual um, to you know, link um, what some of these numbers mean um, in our other, uh, other functions. So uh, <laughs> one more contextual piece is administrative costs are about $44 um, per member per month for QHP plans, for example, and about $6, $6 per member per month for uh, one care. I think it's important to make a quick note about uh, COVID-19 public health emergency as a factor. So the COVID-19 public health emergency has created unique uncertainty for providers, ACOs, and payers in designing and implementing value-based models. So this includes volatile utilization patterns, impacts on quality measurement, linking results to performance and financial uncertainty. Um, so we just need to keep that in mind when we are assessing uh, results. Finally, a note about the approach to the FY23 recommendations. So in FY22 or last year's budget, order, um, the conditions reflected a focus on data-driven monitoring and oversight uh, with a focus on ensuring that the ACO's management drives continuous improvement consistent with a high-performing ACO and then supports achieving the state's health reform goals. Now, um, much of this board is new, so you weren't here for that process, but I know that you're familiar with those materials, but we wanted to note that we're, this is, we're continuing a, a multi-year approach here, and I know um, both board members and the public have referenced some of the materials that were presented last spring on core competencies for high performing ACOs and, and recommendations um, that accompanied those. So this was envisioned as a multi-year approach to be revived in 2023. 
through this budget review and then also in FY24 guidance development process. So the staff recommends continuing to strengthen this approach over the coming year, keeping data driven ACO performance monitoring at the center of our ACO oversight. And we will talk more about that as we go on. So that's the high level overview. I am going to now start to dig into our key areas of review. And they include certification <coughs> and a review of the data analytics transition, uh, ACO budget and financials, total cost of care and trend rates, payer programs and risk model, payment models and fixed perspective payments, uh, as well as the comprehensive payment reform program, population health quality and model of care, performance measurement and improvement, and results to date. And I'm going to turn it over to Russ McCracken for a discussion on uh, the certification. Uh, thanks, Marissa. <clears throat> Sorry, this is uh, Russ McCracken, staff attorney for the board. Um, first off, and for the record, I want to thank uh, Michelle Sawyer um, for leading the certification review and doing most of the work on putting together uh, these slides and the staff's uh, memo on certification. Um, I'm presenting in her absence today, but want to make sure to credit her. Uh, under GMCB Rule 5305, a certified ACO must annually submit to the board a verification that the ACO continues to meet the requirements for certification <clears throat> under statute and rule. Uh, the ACO must uh, also submit to the board any material changes in policies, procedures, organizational structure, provider networks, health information infrastructure, or other matters that are covered by the certification requirements. <clears throat> Uh, OneCare is currently the only certified ACO in Vermont. It was certified by the board in 2018 and it has continued to be certified since then. Procedurally, this year, uh, the board issued a certification eligibility form to OneCare uh, in June. OneCare submitted that form to the board uh, on August 31st. And OneCare also provided responses to the board um, to some follow up questions from board staff on October 14th. Uh, both both of those are available on the board's website. Um, what you see before here is an outline of the rule uh, requirements for certification. Um, there will be a memo from staff covering each section of the rule, so I don't want to go through all of these today. But instead, I want to highlight uh, and review a couple of areas where there have been um, follow-up questions and particular interest. Uh, so, good. Thanks, Marissa. <clears throat> On executive compensation, um, some background. The board issued guidance in May of 2021 uh, regarding executive compensation under Rule 5203. This section of the rule states that an ACO must have a leadership and management structure that aligns with and supports the ACO's efforts to improve quality of care, improve population health, and reduce the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures. The guidance adopted by the board says to comply with Section 5203A of the rule, an ACO must structure its executive compensation to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. So, <clears throat> uh, based on information provided by OneCare, uh, OneCare has corporate goals that align with their strategic plan. Uh, variable pay is a component of each eligible employee's total compensation, but is only paid if the ACO and its employees successfully achieve these goals. Uh, next slide, please, Marissa. <clears throat> so here are the variable pay percentages for OneCare for 2022. Um, for each employee, uh, the variable pay is determined according by the next level of management in OneCare's corporate structure. And then by the OneCare Board of Managers uh, for the uh, OneCare CEO. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pause just to make a note here uh, because it's a question that comes up from time to time. The OneCare Board of Managers composition is subject to requirements uh, set by uh, GMCB in Rule 5202. And also OneCare's operating agreement provides a, a detailed um, 
uh, pr uh, provides the details of the composition of the of one cares board of managers. 75% of the control of one cares board is held by ACO participants. Uh, the, their board has to include at least one Medicare beneficiary, one Medicaid beneficiary and beneficiaries of commercial insurers. Uh, so when we look at the composition under one cares operating agreement, there are uh, three managers appointed by the UVM Health Network as sole member of One Care. And then there are elected managers, the uh, insured beneficiaries that I just mentioned, and then um, managers representing providers, including one nominated by an academic medical center in Vermont, and one nominated by an academic medical center in New Hampshire. Uh, in total, there can be up to 21 managers on the One Care board, uh, but I believe the current number is 19. Uh, so I'll provide, I provide that uh, as some background and reference. Uh, so here are the 2022 goals that are provided that were provided to uh, board staff by One Care. Um, <clears throat> I can uh, review them quickly. I don't want to read through all of them, but these are the goals for the basis of variable pay, um, including goals to improve payment reform by involving, evolving and enhancing payment um, reform programs, uh, improve their network performance to ensure a high quality equitable system that continuously strives to improve healthcare delivery and outcomes, and then deliver an uh, and implement uh, an ACO data, strat data strategic plan. Um, so these, these were the goals that OneCare provided us um, for uh, the basis of awarding variable um, compensation. These were 2022, but the focus of 2023 goals, OneCare said would also be consistent with their strategic plan. And uh, my understanding was expected to be similar. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide here, Marissa. Uh, decision support tools. Under Rule 5206I, an ACO must apply or support participants to apply uh, enrollee and caregiver shared decision-making tools that enable enrollees to assess the merits of various treatment options. Um, staff explored this area in greater depth this year as it was identified uh, as an area of interest in previous years. The tools reported um, as fulfilling these requirements, um, you know, we could say were more care coordination tools um, than tools or methods that enable patients directly to assess treatment options in the uh, and the risks and benefits involved in a particular course of treatment. Uh, One care responded that it was not a clinically integrated organization and it offers a collaborative opportunities to providers <clears throat> um, where education of evidence-based practices can be communicated and shared. And then providers offer decision support directly to the patients. Um, One Care is, is supporting the participants and applying the decision support tools um, and or you know, similar methods for clinical sharing and decision making in that in, in that structured in that way. Uh, so we can Go on to the next slide. Uh, under Rule 5210, there are health IT requirements for an ACO to meet. Um, and I think when OneCare submitted certification materials this summer, there were details related to the new analytics platform that uh, we didn't have. So let me um, just put a pin in the slide for a moment and come back to it in a Come back to this topic in a couple of slides. Uh, so, in terms of board action on certification, um, consistent with our past practice, the GMCB does not need to vote in order to continue One Care certification. Um, the staff are preparing, and we will send around a memo um, to the board and it will be made public also, I believe, covering that 
in more detail the specific elements of uh, what cares continued eligibility for um, certification under the rule. Um, board action would be needed on the other hand if the board were to um, conclude that one care no longer met some requirement uh, to be eligible for certification. And in that case, the board would provide notice to the ACO and an opportunity to respond um, before uh, requiring the ACO to take some sort of corrective action to remedy whatever that um, deficiency or, or shortcoming was. Um, there's a process set out for, for that remedial action in the rule. Um, I won't go through it now, but uh, it's established and it gives uh, the ACO plenty of opportunity to know what the perceived deficiency is and um, respond to it. Uh, so next slide, Marissa. Um, this is somewhat under certification, somewhat under budget review, and somewhat under neither. Uh, so we want to look specifically at the uh, One Care's planned transition of its data analytics um, platform to run through the University of Vermont Health Network and give the board a suggested process approach here. So further review of the, the One Care transition um, could be addressed in the FY23 budget process, but the analytics transition um, is not necessarily a part of that budget process. One Care informed the board um, in the summer prior to submitting its budget of the transition plan and one Care and um, UVMHN signed a contract uh, in um, the fall here, not too long ago, prior to uh, you know completed review and approval of the FY23 budget. So while the transition has an impact on the sources and uses of One Care's FY23 funds. Uh, One Care did testify that the transition is overall budget neutral. So further review of this arrangement could be done outside of the FY23 budget process under the board's monitoring authority in Rule 5503. Uh, so under Rule 5503, the board may use any and all powers granted to it by law to monitor an ACO's performance or operations or to investigate an ACO's compliance with the requirements of this rule other applicable laws or regulations and decisions and orders uh, of the board. And there's a process set out in the in the rule that says their views can be performed at any time. It's not limited to the budget process. Um, and to conduct that for, for further review or monitoring of the ACO's operations, the, the board would um, advise one care of the specific areas that are being reviewed and any statutory or regulatory provisions under examination. <clears throat> and we're suggesting that the board move um, any additional follow up on this arrangement or um, further monitoring of this arrangement outside of the FY23 budget process. Um, I think that allows for additional questions, review, uh, ongoing monitoring. Um, this approach also allows the board to monitor and um, sort of ensure, for example, that all appropriate safeguards against sharing of competitively sensitive information are in place and being followed um, you know, on a, a going forward basis. So um, that, is, that is our suggestion. Uh, I do want to be a little bit careful or particular in talking about the analytics transition. Um, one care testified that it was budget neutral in reference to the total amount spent by one care, but the specific uses of funds, um, you know, they are impacted in the FY23 budget by the transition. Uh, so inherently there is that 
aspect of the transition that is part of the FY23 budget. Um, notwithstanding that, our, our overall recommendation is to move the kind of further any further review and monitoring um, to a separate to a separate process, not um, specifically tied to the FY23 budget. And so next slide. Uh, I think I, with that, Marissa, I'm turning it back to you. Yes, I'm going to turn it over to our financial analyst, Matt Sutter. Good to go, Matt. Hang on just a minute. I think he was having a technical issue with Teams. So let me just check on that for you real quick. Sorry, can you hear me now? Sure can. Apologies. Uh, tech issues, even in the office. Um, so I'm just going to be reviewing One Care's uh, budget and financials. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is just, um, I'm just so as Marissa mentioned at the start, um, we kind of look at the budget in two ways: their full accountability and entity level. Um, I won't repeat what she said, but just to reiterate, the full accountability budget includes all spending for attributed lives for total cost of care services, population health expenditures, and administrative expenses. By contrast, the entity level or uh, gap budget only includes elements which one care through its government structure has discretion over. So that is not contractually obligated. Um, I do want to mention here that uh, one care sometimes used the a forty five point one million dollar figure when discussing their entity level budget. Um, it's not necessarily a discrepancy. What they're doing is taking the the twenty five point five million that we're discussing and including the full value of the population health management base payment. Um, blueprint and sash funds. So it's slightly different, but um, it's largely looking at the same thing. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And this is a uh, the same slide Marissa presented earlier, um, just giving a, a rundown of what the full accountability and entity level budgets look like. I think we can move to the next one. So here you'll see their full accountability. Oh, let me back up for one second. So the way I'm going to go about presenting this is we're going to look at a full accountability budget first. Um, this high level overview or a summary statement includes income and expenses. And then um, on the forthcoming slides, we'll look at revenue um, separately and expenditures separately. Um, so here you can see their submitted FY23 budget includes an additional $95 million over FY22. Um, while there's some growth and small growth in FPP, this growth is largely a result of $92 million increase in that external total cost of care, um, as you can see at the top line. Um, beyond that, I think we can kind of look at administrative revenue ratio down at the bottom, um, pretty consistent from prior year, and that's just looking at a proportion of their operating expenses to their overall expenses. Um, and similar with the PHM ratios and uh, with and without blueprint. We move to the next slide. Uh, looking first at the revenue side, um, just you can see visually and uh, in the table that the growth is largely, as I mentioned, in that uh, total cost of care. I would also like to draw your attention to the other revenues line since the label might be slightly confusing. Um, these are their, the fixed payment offset. Uh, like participation fees, these revenues come from hospitals, but through a slightly different mechanism. We can move to the next slide. Um, not a whole lot to say on the expense side. You'll see a similar story here, um, that top line external health care spend growing, um, making up the majority of the growth here. There's, as Ross mentioned, there's movement within the operating expenses below, um, though it's relatively neutral. I think we'll save that discussion for the entity level budget because I think it makes a little bit more sense um, contextually to discuss it there. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, just visualizing that, like the growth, the 
revenue changes. Um, here you can kind of see just the scale of the total cost of care kind of dwarfing everything else. Um, basically the same information from the previous slide, just kind of presented in a visual format. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Yep. And this is if we just looked at that total cost of care growth at 92 million, this is like a reconciliation of um, that component. So we're kind of just drilling down into that $92 million increase. Uh, within that, you can see nearly $18 million reduction in Medicare revenues being offset by increases in, in Medicaid and private payers. Next slide, please. And here we're looking at the population health management um, expense reconciliation. While the total PHMs are increasing by about $800,000 net, there is some movement within that line item. So we just wanted to break out the uh, individual components of that. Um, these changes reflect the shifting to a new PHM payment model and a phase out of some program support, um, which Marissa will discuss in the population health section. And the next slide just shows, I wanted to show the uh, breakout of the base and bonus uh, PHM payments by provider. Um, the, oh gosh, they're all kind of similar colors, but the, the darker blue, I guess, bluish green um, on the left is FY22. The middle column will be the base only, and then the column on the far right is the base and the bonus potential um, by provider type. I think we can move to the next slide. Uh, switching over to the entity level budget, this is, as we mentioned, only looking at gap revenues, um, similar to what you'd find on their audited financial statements. Um, the entity level budget's fairly stable. It's increasing only about 2% from the prior year. Um, and because of this, if you see the ratios at the bottom, they're staying relatively stable as well. Though there, you can see a slight increase in PHM ratio relative to the administrative ratio. Um, the next slide, um, I mentioned it, I think, briefly on the full accountability revenue slide, but I think it jumps out a little bit better here. The $5 million in other revenue or $5.6 million in other revenue, um, you can see growing from 4.6 in the prior year. Um, in, let's see. Well, it's only increasing just under about $500,000. Um, net uh, in a relative sense you can see a slight shift from participation fees to the fixed payment offset that other revenues line and next slide please here's the expense side of their entity level budget um i think in prior years we had just one line for their operating expenditures this year i think we decided to break it out um, a little bit better just because there is that movement with the analytics piece um, just showing the salaries, benefits, uh, contract purchase services, software, and other revenues um, on this summary statement. And as discussed, there was some shift there um, due to the analytics change. Uh, this is just illustrating what we discussed a couple um, slides back. So the revenue for their entity level budget entirely comes from hospital revenues and um, what you're seeing here is like a, a slight decrease in participation or about a half million dollar decrease in participation fees and a, about a million dollar increase in that other revenue, that fixed payment offset. So um, netting out at about a half million dollar increase to their entity level budget. Next, thank you. Um, so this is similar to the, the population health management slide we showed in the full about accountability section, but just focused on the um, gap component to the changes to the PHM programs. Again, uh, Marissa will be discussing the programmatic changes in greater detail, but um, just wanted to provide some a visual way of kind of doing the changes. And one of the major changes this year um, is a shift, as discussed, uh, the analytics to a contract with UVM. While the shift's net neutral, there was some movement between the lines within operating expenses to account for this. Um, you can see movement here, um, like net movement in those lines, um, but it's worth noting the changes above aren't entirely the result of the analytics change. I can give 
there's some other ones that did. Um, I'll give an example of the the benchmarking item was included in software in FY22, but in FY23 it was moved to um, purchase services. So just some small change, there's some changes like that and movement um, occurring there. One care provided the board with a more detailed breakout of these changes, but some of the figures involve confidential information. So um, just provided a kind of high level overview of the, the changes here. And this slide shows just looking at operating expenses, kind of the concentration among those uh, four categories. So you can see the contract and purchase services growing considerably um, and salaries and benefits decreasing, you know, as a proportion of their total operating expenses. And this is just uh, largely reflective of that analytics shift that we discussed. So um, kind of key takeaways, um, growth in their full accountability budgets, largely driven by external healthcare spend. Um, as mentioned, you're seeing some decrease in Medicare revenues being offset by increase in Medicaid and private payers. Um, the shift in analytics to a UVM contract as one care testified is net neutral, but for some um, overlap in services during the transition. Um, and one cares overall operating expenses are relatively stable, um, down just about a percent half from FY22. And um, so our recommended approach is to require one care to notify Greenmont Care Board of material changes to their budget, explain the variance, require one care to submit a revised budget by March 31st, and present a revised budget in April 20 by uh, April 23, including final pay. You know what? I won't read this whole thing. Um, it's consistent with last year's. I think the some additional language, as Ross noted about um, regarding evaluation and reporting costs, and consistent with prior years collecting audited financials and 990s in through the ACO reporting manual. And I think that does it. Um, so I will pass it over to Sarah, who I think is believe is next. Thank you, Matt. Um, can folks hear me? Great. OK, um, so I'm going to be walking us through total cost of care, TCOC uh, and trend rates. And then after that, also the payer programs and risk model section. Uh, next slide, please. So. This slide, once it comes up, there we go, um, is going to it walks us through really how um, how's the trend, so the rate of increase and the benchmark, the ACO total cost of care spending target within each payer program uh, set. So for Medicare, GMCB has a big role uh, in that. Um, more to come on that at next week's board meeting. Uh, for Medicaid, uh, DIVA and OneCare can negotiate a benchmark. Um, there are actuaries involved in that process, and the board reviews this through the Medicaid advisory rate case process. And then for the commercial payers, it's really a negotiation between each payer and one care in terms of the trend and the benchmark and the programmatic components. Um, though we do want to note that the board's rate review decisions are one component uh, since that process does cover the medical trend for each filing. So this is kind of summary of, you know, where does the board have levers? Who has levers to decide these things? Uh, next slide, please. So this this table shows the expected total cost of care, so the program benchmark um, for each payer program, along with the budgeted trend from the base experience. Um, the key thing to note here is that the base experience is not the same as projected FY22 total cost of care, that green column. So we wanted to kind of set that aside. Um, most programs calculate the benchmark based on historical spending for the projected attributed population, which will vary between performance years, and they also need to look back uh, you know, farther than just the prior performance year, since FY22 data is still, you know, still happening, um, still incomplete. So these trends, um, you know, you can't, you can't uh, go from the green column to the trend to the FY23 column. We just want to make that really clear. Uh, so the next slide, thank you. Um, the key takeaways in the total cost of care and trend rates uh, section is really setting the financial targets is still really hard. Um, the pandemic has had some big impacts on what makes it so challenging to set those targets. Um, and we'll be discussing the implications of those trend rates and especially uh, the Medicare trend for um, for all pair model agreement total cost of care. So the APM TCOC measure targets at the December 14th presentation and staff recommendation on uh, the Medicare ACO initiative benchmark. Um, so we'll we'll get to hear more about that from Sarah and Lindsay next week. Next slide. 
So the, re the recommended approach here is to require one care to implement the benchmark trend rates from the payer contracts in alignment with the board's decision uh, on the Medicare ACO benchmark uh, with the board's uh, Medicaid advisory rate case. And finally, for commercial payer contracts in alignment with the ACO attributed population and the board's approved rate filings. Um, and that is very consistent with past years. Um, staff may also recommend uh, requiring additional information from One Care to support a better understanding of what commercial payer data is available to One Care during trend and benchmark negotiations um, to kind of build on what we've done in past years to, uh, requiring actuarial certification um, of those trend rates. Uh, next slide. Um, so now we're going to move on to a, a summary of the payer programs and the risk model. Um, in this section, we'll be walking through a summary of OneCare's risk model for each payer program, total risk by HSA um, for both the risk-based entities, that's the hospitals uh, and primary care providers, and discussing the processes for distributing shared savings and shared losses across the provider network. Marissa's reading my mind now, thank you. Um, so a little bit of background on the risk model. Um, One Care Vermont assumes risk from payers in their payer contracts to care for a particular population as specified, um, these contracts do not specifically distribute uh, or specify the distribution of shared savings or shared losses to the ACO provider network. That is something that One Care designs and implements um, in 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 their agreements with their provider network. So, payers and One Care decide together how much total risk there is, but it's One Care and their providers that decide, um, you know, how that gets spread across the network. And we're going to talk um, through the second aspect of that a little bit more. Um, I do want to remind folks that these analyses are based solely uh, on One Care's budget submission. Um, so many of these contracts, all these contracts, are not yet final and signed, uh, uh, to my knowledge, at least. Uh, which is uh, why we are we have not reviewed them yet, um, and you know we'll have we'll kind of have more to say on that in the spring once um, those contracts are negotiated. Uh, and I should say Medicare and Medicaid contracts are usually finalized by the end of December and required to be in effect or right around the end of December uh, and are required to be in effect for January 1st. Um, those commercial contracts often are not finalized until early spring uh, and usually are presented with the revised budget analysis. All right, the table on the next slide briefly describes the payment models, risk arrangements, uh, and tie to quality in each of One Care's payer contracts. Um, I won't read through the table, um, but instead just want to highlight um, that One Care has budgeted for their risk corridors to increase by one percentage point uh, in the Medicare program and uh, both the Medicaid traditional and expanded risk models. So up to 3% now for Medicare in the Medicaid traditional cohort and uh, up to 2% in the Medicare, uh, excuse me, Medicaid expanded attribution, attribution cohort. Um, quality remains a component of settlement calculations for all payers. Uh, and for Medicaid, uh, uh, also a component of the population health model um, uh, payments uh, for that payer. Um, commercial arrangement, risk arrangements are redacted here. Those are um, confidential. Um, so Marissa will dig into the payment models uh, in a later section, but this table just kind of in includes a quick overview to show how, how those can relate to the risk model. Um, on the next slide, um, we are looking at so so we've got these risk arrangements, these risk corridors. How does this add up to total cost to total risk? Um, I borrowed this chart from One Care's slides uh, to show how total risk across payer programs um, has evolved uh, since the original 2020 budget submission, so the pre-COVID budget submission, um, showing here that there was a huge decrease in risk after the pandemic hit, um, and we're just now getting close to hitting pre-COVID levels. So for FY23, we're looking at 36.5 million in total risk. Um, the next slide uh, digs into that a little bit more deeply. Um, this slide shows the budgeted risk from 2019 to 2023, so going back a little bit earlier, one year earlier, as well as the percentage of risk um, held kind of at the one care entity level um, versus delegated to the provider network. This budgeted risk um, is worth showing uh, because it's the the risk uh, level that One Care was planning for um, prior to the onset of the pandemic, that's referring to the 2020 pre pandemic column. Um, again, One Care has brought that total risk level back uh, much closer to pre pandemic levels for FY23. Um, but that said, risk relative to total cost of care uh, is still a smaller proportion. Um, one thing that I want to highlight here is that the One Care held portion of risk is also quite a bit lower than in pre COVID years. 
Um, for context, One Care typically has taken on risk as a glide path to support health service areas who are newly joining payer programs, but not quite ready um, for the full risk level uh, in their first year. Um, since we're calling out One Care held risk, we also want to call out um, One Care held uh, net assets and equity, which also includes a reserve of 3.9 million that the board required in its 2019 budget order, um, as well as net assets. Um, one Care also, we want to note, has a $10 million line of credit as required um, in their contract with Medicare. So how is this risk? Um, how are any savings or losses uh, distributed throughout the One Care network? Um, One Care has a couple of major policies and procedures that I'm going to walk through briefly because it's in these policies and procedures that One Care documents how these incentives are passed down to the providers in their network. So first, the program settlement policy outlines what happens to dollars at settlement. So savings to be paid out to providers um, or dollars to be collected from providers to cover losses. Um, as these slides show, this includes $1.50 PMPM of first dollar shared savings and shared losses for primary care practices through um, what's called the primary care accountability pool. Um, this was in existence last year, so this is you'll this will remind um, folks who saw last year's presentation uh, a lot of the FY22 budget, uh, and we'll dig into that a bit more deeply on the next slide. If one care achieves savings and there are remaining savings after that 150 p.m. p.m. excuse me, um, they are split 90-10 with 90% going to participating hospitals referred to as risk bearing entities, uh, and the last 10% going to um, high performing health service areas uh, through a performance incentive pool, which we'll also cover uh, a little bit later. Um, some dollars can also get pulled out to fund one care expenses that are approved by their board of managers. So on the next slide, we go a little deeper into the primary care accountability pool and performance incentive pool. Um, rather than walk through the mechanics uh, as they're described here, uh, I think the most important things to note are that of that um, 36.5 million in total risk. One care has budgeted for 3.7 million, so just over 10% to be held by primary care um, through the primary care accountability pool. This is an increase from 2022 when primary care held 2.4 million in risk. Uh, however, it account it accounted for the big for a bigger share, about 15% last year, uh, and this year uh, a little bit lower, 10%. Um, the performance incentive pool rewards high performing uh, HSAs based on year over year PMPM PM, uh, and avoidable ED visits. Um, so year over year change in those two measures. The total amount of the pool depends on the amount of shared savings achieved. So it's not something that we can really provide an estimate for. So on the next slide, we go even a little bit deeper into that primary care accountability pool and how risk and savings are split across the primary care uh, and across uh, excuse me, split between primary care and each health service area's um, risk-bearing risk entity. Um, so of that 36.5 million total, non-hospital primary care providers are carrying uh, 2.1 million, while hospital, pr hospital primary care uh, is carrying about 1.6 million. Um, the RBEs are carrying the remaining 32.8. Um, down at the bottom of this table, I have shown kind of how this works out in terms of the proportion of total risk noting uh, that this does not quite uh, add up to 100 due to rounding. Um, and I think one key takeaway that we can draw from this, um, if you do a, a bit of quick math, is that hospitals in the UVM Health Network, so CVMC, uh, uh, UVM Medical Center, and Porter uh, collectively hold 17.3 million of the risk held by the hospitals. So of all the hospital-based risk, 52%. Um, when we add in hospital-based primary care in those regions, it totals 50% of all risk in the ACO network. Um, so in the next slide, we're, we're, we've been looking ahead to 2023. Right now, we're gonna take a moment to look back to 2021. This slide summarizes the 2021 settlement for One Care's payer program. So the shared savings they received, the shared losses they were required to pay, um, which was also presented at the November 22nd payer panel. Um, again, this risk was distributed to, to One Care's providers according to their policies um, that applied to 2021. Um, so on the next slide, before we wrap up this section, um, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Medicare contract and specifically what's known um, as the advanced shared savings component. So of that 36.5 million in risk, 
nine and a half million dollars comes in the form of the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings. Um, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of the all pair model agreement. Um, Vermont had previously participated in a Medicare demonstration called the Medicare uh, Advanced Primary Care Practice Demonstration, the MAPCP demo, um, which allowed Medicare to join into the Blueprint for Health and kind of associated programs, so PCMH, CHT, and SASH payments, and to join into Vermont's payment model and contribute um, as a pair to Vermont's model. The um, This effort was evaluated very successfully, um, and the all-pair model agreement includes provisions um, to allow Medicare to continue to, con to contribute those re to really foundational programs in Vermont by providing the ACO with an advance against any future shared savings. So that funding is attached to the Medicare benchmark as a manual adjustment. So whatever the advanced shared savings amount is, it kind of started as one amount and has been trended up every year. This year, 9.5 million is budgeted. Uh, that amount is added to whatever the Med Medicare benchmark would otherwise be, but it doesn't really represent performance risk. The advance is reconciled at settlement, so if one care doesn't save more than the advance amount, they'd be required to pay dollars back to Medicare. But the benchmark itself, the goal is higher than it otherwise would be. Um, so this was kind of uh, the way that Vermont could continue to receive these, uh, these funds, continue to have Medicare invest in these important programs. Um, but that said, ACO providers have expressed that they perceive this as an asymmetric risk corridor, even though it's accompanied by that bump uh, in the benchmark itself. And this is something that, again, will get covered a little bit more uh, next week when we talk about the benchmark, when the board hears from, from staff about the benchmark. But we're telling you this because one care is taking on risk from payers, including from Medicare, as an ACO, and they decide how to delegate it. Um, so next slide, wrapping up this section, um, key, takeaway, key takeaways are that the total budgeted FY23 risk and reward, again, 36.5 million, the one care held risk is a very small portion of that total risk, and it's decreased both um, in dollars and percent of total risk over time. Um, the primary care accountability pool is pushing uh, first dollar risk uh, and potential reward to primary care practices according to total attribution. Um, the total primary care accountability pool for FY23 is budgeted at, apologies, there's a typo here, 3.7 million, 10% of total risk, uh, and primary care about accountability pool um, for non-hospital owned primary care, so for independent primary care and FQHCs, uh, is 2.1 million. And excuse me, there's another typo here that should say FY23 budget. Um, the performance incentive pool sets aside 10% of total shared savings after that First dollar 150 PMPM to reward high performing HSAs based on these two measures that we discussed. And finally, this um, kind of rehashes the advanced shared savings information that we just discussed. So finally, um, the recommended staff approach here, um, a lot of this is consistent with past years, and there's also some that's new. So consistent with past years. To the extent possible, um, we uh, we would like to require one care to develop and engage in scale qualifying payer programs uh, and where this isn't possible to provide us information on, you know, what makes it not possible and why. Um, in addition, as an FY22, we recommend encouraging one care to pursue payer programs with Medicare Advantage plans, particularly those that are operated uh, in Vermont. Later in this presentation, Michelle uh, Degree will review using will re review uh, Vermont's rising Medicare Advantage enrollment. Um, so suffice to say, it's growing really, really rapidly, um, which drives home that this is going to be a really important area to watch uh, in the next couple of years because M MA plans have not historically had pair contracts with One Care or other Vermont ACOs. That said, uh, we've received feedback from One Care and from these payers uh, that these plans, uh, the Vermont-based plans, um, are still really young and that developing new ACO pair contracts may not be feasible uh, while enrollment is still not stable. So recognizing these factors, which I think are reasonable, um, we do wanna continue to push for alignment here. So we're recommending establishing a two-year target for 2024. Next, um, consistent with past years, we recommend requiring one care to implement the ACO risk model as described uh, and notify the board of any changes. Um, and finally, uh, a new condition um, staff plan to recommend that OneCare as an organization hold risk for the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings Amount. 
um, rather than delegating that risk to the provider network. Um, this would mean that if savings in the Medicare program were insufficient to cover that advanced shared savings amount, that 9.5 million, one care would have to cover the different without passing that risk on to the provider network. Um, as described earlier, this really is not performance risk, which is why we feel it shouldn't be passed on to providers. Um, earlier, we also reviewed one care's net assets and reserves. Um, obviously, they are less than the total advanced shared savings amount at the moment. Um, so if this is a condition that the board pursues, one care would need to strategize about how to cover this amount in the event that they need to pay some or all of that amount back to Medicare. Um, and Sarah Lindbergh uh, will talk a little bit more uh, about this again next week. And with all of that said, um, I am going to pass it on to Marissa. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to move now to a discussion of payment models, um, mostly focused on fixed perspective payment and comprehensive payment reform program payment. This is a contextual slide that we used last year um, with a nice visual uh, for your reference showing funds flow and how um, dollars flow through the ACO from um, the payer to the ACO, the ACO to providers um, and payers to providers. I'm not going to walk through all this, but I think it helps to contextualize um, uh, how this payment works. And we borrowed this uh, visual from the first um, University of Chicago NRC evaluation um, that is posted on our website. Um, and what I'm going to discuss here is looking at the proportion of total payments, which are value based and proportion of total payments, which use uh, a fixed payment or population based payment. Okay, so the, the takeaway from this slide is that the proportion of fixed perspective payments to overall total cost of care has remained relatively stable um, over time. And uh, you'll see on a later slide, that's roughly around um, 30, 30%. Um, this, the fixed perspective payments here that I'm talking about include all things that are, that are called a fixed perspective payment, whether they are reconciled or unreconciled. Um, and what that means is, um, Medicare, the Medicare fixed perspective payment, also known as the uh, AIPBP or all inclusive populace based, population based payment, um, is an upfront pay, payment to providers, but it is reconciled at year end to the fee for service equivalent. Um, so this uh, is often discussed as sort of being perceived in effect as the same thing as fee for service. However, it does pr provide a cash flow mechanism um, and it is considered a um, fixed perspective payment for our. Our purposes of reporting this, the just the mechanism is is different. Um, the fixed perspective payment in the Medicaid program um, is an unreconciled payment. So the the upfront payment is the amount, um, uh, and it's not reconciled to fee for service at the end of the year. Um, the blue <laughs> blue cross blue shield um, fixed perspective payment pilot um, is is reconciled, and that's a small pilot with one hospital. So all of those payments that I just discussed. Um, and the comprehensive payment reform payments are, are in that kind of light green um, bucket. So the comprehensive payment reform program or uh, CPR is a pair blended fixed payments for independent primary care practices or core primary care services, plus additional an additional per member per month for non-core services. CPR payments are fixed for the primary care practice, but they are reconciled back to fee for service and settled with the HSA risk bearing entity. So they are reconciled at the primary care practice level. So it's a true fixed payment primary care practices. Um, but since there is not an unreconciled arrangement with the payer, um, those uh, that those payments are reconciled at the at the hospital level. This chart uh, is meant to show you the growth in the CPR program. Year over year, we get regular reporting from One Care um, on this program. So from 2018 to uh, 2022, um, and sorry if it's really small, um, but this represents the the funding revenues. So um, the larger proportion of it um, is um, you know that payer blended uh, contract revenue, and then there is a hospital funded investment. Um, in this program as well. So that represents uh, a redistribution of funds from hospitals to independent primary care practices. Um, and then overlaid on that, I have growth um, of attribution in the program overall. So lives, 
lives in this program, which have grown from, uh, I think it's around uh, 12,000 in the first year of the program up to around 25,000 now. And then on the side there, I have growth in the count of, of practice sites um, that have been uh, that are that are part of this program, and it is a, a growing program. This table is our analysis of fixed prospective payments as a percent of expected total cost of care, and what are known as the HCP land categories. So this this is the Healthcare Payment Learning Action Network. Um, this is a national framework to categorize. Uh, different types of alternative payment models. There's a reference slide at the end of this deck that um, explains that a little and gives you a link if you're not familiar with that. But this is a way at looking at the payments within OneCare and understanding sort of where they fall on the continuum of value-based payments, which begin, you know, with fee-for-service, no link to quality or value, um, all the way up to, you know, global budgets or fully capitated payments and kind of what the steps are in the way, so um, along the way. So we like to look at the payments and sort of understand where they fit into that categorization. <clears throat> okay, uh, and just a note, um, the, the categories are not perfect to Vermont's arrangements, but this is the, you know, the best framework that we have to provide us with a national comparison um, and we, that we've used since the <laughs> inception of the, of the model. I'll also note that there is not one way to design these models. The goal is to link payments to quality and value, but not all arrangements have to be category four in order to, you know, for this to work well. So we're not necessarily saying everything has to move to an unreconciled fixed perspective payment. Um, there, there is a continuum which can be used and designed differently for different provider types. Um, on this table here, we have average attribution. Um, so I don't think I need to get into this too much unless people have questions, but um, the average attribution is the number. It's not the it's not the number that's counted as of January one. It's the average number of attributed lives over time that are used to set the budget. Just want to give you some context for that, um, and and to give you a sense of magnitude. Um, and so staff took the FY23 budgeted figures for expected total cost of care and fixed payments. Uh, to calculate the total fixed payments at a, as a percent of expected total cost of care. Um, and so we did it, um, the, so the calculation here, again, is total fixed payments. So unreconciled and unreconciled FVP plus CPR. Um, and you can see that um, Medicare um, is around 47%, Medicaid um, around 55, 56, we have that broken out. Um, Commercial overall is around a little over 1% and the total is around 30%, which is that number I referenced earlier, and that's been relatively stable. Okay. All right, so this year, again, we looked at uh, FPP over time um, in the different in the different payer programs. So those are the solid lines. You can see commercial in the yellow is down is below. Um, Medicare overall FPP um, again has been relatively stable from 18 to 23. Um, Medicaid, which has the highest uh, uh, proportion of fixed perspective payments, has also been relatively stable. So the board has asked over time to set targets um, for achieving higher levels of fixed perspective payments. Um, noting that moving to this type of payment um, is one of the goals of, of moving toward value-based arrangements. So we have done uh, several, we have gone through a process um, on setting these targets. And there's some challenges here um, because again, the decisions around fixed perspective payments and operationalizing that did not sit unilaterally, <coughs> excuse me, with one care. Um, it's a negotiation with their, with their payers. Um, so um, we can't, we can't, necessarily mandate a target and then hold hold one care to that because it is within partnership um, with their with their payer program. So most recently, um, one care submitted a report uh, giving us the data on fixed perspective payments in July 22. Um, and they um, they amended their goals. Um, their original goals that were set in May 22 and presented with their FY22 revised budget had set uh, goals at 53% uh, 
28.4% for Medicare, 58.2% for Medicaid, and commercial at 23.9%. Um, in the more recent reporting, they uh, amended the Medicare and commercial goals down to zero. And, you know, in the con con uh, conversation on this, um, that is to reflect sort of the current state that they, we don't have a you know, we don't have additional arrangements um, for um, FY23 um, and um, one care, you know, didn't feel like they could set a goal that they um, felt was uh, unattainable. Um, but we would still like to um, put a goal uh, out there to, to strive for. And the goals that we are recommending um, is closer to the original um, goals that were set, um, which is working toward moving commercial to 24% um, and Medicaid to 55. There's something, um, the Medicare line there, um, I'm not 100% uh, clear why it was adjusted down because my understanding is they're already above that number. But essentially, the goal is to reflect the current commitment to unreconciled CPR, or sorry, FPP in the Medicaid program. Um, Medicare, we're not recommending a goal because Medicare has indicated it will not convert to unreconciled FPP in the current model. Um, so we expect that to remain status quo. Um, Medicaid, again, we're reflecting current commitment. And then commercial, um, we know for 23 um, that we don't expect new commercial offerings, but um, payers have indicated in their presentations before this board, even and possibly in rate review um, uh, discussions or, or proceedings that um, they, you know, this is something that is, is being explored. So we think it is appropriate to set a goal. Yeah. So key takeaways. Uh, again, the payment models are, are consistent, no major changes. Um, for under, in regards to FPP, um, there, we understand there's a satisfaction with and a commitment to unreconciled Medicaid FPP. Medicare has indicated it will not convert to unreconciled FPP in the current model, um, and commercial lags in providing any non-fee-for-service payment models within their risk-based contracts. However, uh, payers have expressed willingness and progress in this area and and one care um, similarly has expressed you know um, operational uh, readiness and, and willingness as well uh, for the cpr program um, the the cpr program receives positive feedback and is expanding uh, significant expansion could put pressure on hospitals that absorb the fee-for-service settlement we haven't explored this um, further but it is um, uh, an area to look into um, exploring the expansion of the CPR program to hospital employed primary care and FQHCs was mentioned in the One Care budget. Um, they are also exploring the CPR program moving to a percent of total cost of care as a way of achieving an increased percentage spent on primary care and linking primary care reimbursement with overall trends. Um, we are also curious about that. Um, but my understanding is that these aren't necessarily for the 23 budget, they're, they're looking ahead. So the recommended approach to fixed perspective payment this year. Um, so, so the reason why we're setting these goals is because it's actually a requirement in the budget order and was set in guidance um, for 23. So per, per the budget order and the 23 industry guidance, the Green Mountain Care Board staff recommend adopting goals for FPP, um, which we would include in the FY24 guidance. Those are Medicaid at 55%, commercial 24%. Uh, the ACO, as they have done, must continue to report FPP data and progress toward the goals as specified in the ACO reporting manual and FY24 guidance. And we want to state that the goals reflect an aspiration, not a concrete plan. The language that we used on this uh, in the order, I believe, or, or the guidance was that the ACO sh shall use best efforts to meet or exceed the goals uh, as modified here by the, the Green Mountain Care Board. And I want to met, um, mention that this issue has been discussed as a, a goal or strategy in the 2020 all-payer model implementation Im improvement plan. Um, and I want to note that um, in that improvement plan, it was mentioned that Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, and OneCare identify clear milestones for including FPP in new contract model design. Um, and also, um, you know, we are hoping that the Medicare fixed payment model will align with the Medicaid but we know that that is not achievable at this time um, per discussions with Medicare. And then the recommended approach on CPR 
um, is to share the One Care Vermont CPR program evaluation, which was mentioned in their budget submission and presentation. This can be part of uh, reporting manual requirements. Again, this isn't a new evaluation. It's an evaluation that they mentioned they're doing, um, and we think it would be valuable to review. We would also like to discuss and have them provide information on the impact of moving CPR to a percentage of total cost of care. I think um, that this could be discussed uh, potentially uh, in the revised budget conversation, um, but we can work out appropriate timing. And we would also have them continue to provide the CPR standard reporting, which is consistent with past years, um, and the requirements are, are laid out in our reporting manual. That moves us along to the next section, population health, quality, and model of care. This section of the budget uh, itself is large, uh, including ACL quality, population health, model care, community integration efforts. I'm going to review um, major programmatic changes and, and sum up um, criteria. So this slide, um, not a substitute for reviewing the statutory criteria, but it's meant to boil down the seven criteria that are most applicable to review of the ACL model of care and population health programs. Um, the uh, let me quickly on the slide. So what the board is required to do is to review and consider um, incentives and resources, information and effort. So essentially payment changes um, that that the model allows, um, data that is collected and, and shared, um, and efforts or tools that are used to support providers um, in, in implementing uh, programs and, and moving towards, toward value-based models. Key criteria in the statute, um, include strengthening primary care, the effects on appropriate utilization, uh, and there's some specific call-outs here for integration with community-based providers in the blueprint for health, uh, mental health, substance use disorder, for example, and addressing social determinants of health and the impact of adverse childhood events. And again, of all the criteria um, we identified, um, I think those seven that are down in the corner that are most relevant to this particular section. Um, and I want to note that the statute provides the board with considerable discretion in deciding whether these criteria are satisfied. All right, so this is a summary of the six programmatic changes that we identified through the budget review. Um, on the next several slides, I'll go into more <laughs> details <coughs> on some of these as needed. Uh, the first one here is the new population health payment model. So this streamlines three payments into two, um, the PHM base payments and PHM bonus payments. Second one is the sunset of care navigator for care coordination reporting. Um, this is going to end uh, eminently here at the end of 2022, the use of this software. Um, however, OneCare detailed the new requirements for care coordination payments which are triannual reporting, validation audits, and um, an annual meeting. There is an updated clinical committee structure to align with the strategic plan. Um, and this committee structure is meant to inform the care model, quality accountability metrics, health equity, data, um, and analytics. There's some updates to their focus areas, which include food insecurity, suicide prevention, chronic disease, and then the PHM accountability six measures, which I'm gonna show you on a later slide. Um, updates, there are updates to their provider reports and data. These include, these are reports that are given to, um, to providers to provide them with, with information. Um, these include health disparity scorecards, primary care panel report, quarterly VBIF reporting, that's the value-based incentive fund or its new equivalent, key performance indicators, um, the benchmark report, um, and then uh, again, uh, the new analytics, you know, this was done through the new analytics platform. And then there are some goals that they talk about in this section. One of them is to demonstrate statistically significant improvement at the ACO level for all measures included in the PHM accountability policies, um, as well as um, include a review of health equity in all efforts across the ACO. I'm gonna go into some de a little detail about some of these. So this slide, or detail that I think will help you um, understand some of these. This uh, slide reviews the new population health management payment model as described by, by OneCare. Our understanding is that it supplies the same cash flow to providers in total potential of 17.6 million. Again, they budgeted um, 
that about 80% of the eligible providers will be successful in earning the bonus dollar. So that 15.3 is the base um, and the 2.3 is the potential bonus earnings. Um, eligible providers to receive these payments include hospitals and hospital primary care, independent primary care practices, FQHCs, designated agencies, home health, area agency on aging. So again, this sort of redistributes and, and provides um, funds to these providers to help them um, pay for, or for things that may not otherwise be covered. So the structure of the clinical committees are important. They are responsible for making decisions using data and expertise regarding one care's program. So in the um, previous budget submission, One Care noted that one of their goals for FY22 was to reevaluate the structure of their clinical committees and to seek opportunities to clarify uh, their purpose and effectiveness in alignment with their strategic plan goals. This is the updated chart describing One Care's new clinical committee structure. These are the population health management accountability measures for primary care. So it includes these six measures, potentially avoidable ED visits by those with two ED visits in the last 90 days, follow up after hypertension diagnosis, age 40 plus all payer, annual wellness visits, diabetes, um, poor control, child and adolescent well visits and developmental screening. Uh, these are measures that are tied to bonus payments. Um, and I just wanted to note here that they did mention this goal of demonstrating statistically significant improvement at the ACO level for all measures included in the population health management accountability policies. And I'm, I'm actually going to talk about this again in the performance measurement section. All right, so these are the key performance indicators that were discussed in their budget submission. So in collaboration with the University of Vermont College of Medicine clinical research team, OneCare has developed phase one KPIs. The second phase of these will be put in place after their new health analytics platform launches in 2023. Um, in this first phase, the KPIs are for four key groups. So all of OneCare, primary care practices, HSA communities and hospitals. Uh, KPIs currently in the first phase of development include um, these listed on the slide. There is some, you know, we've been looking at all these different reports and outcomes measures, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next section. Um, but there is a general overlap of these measures with the Medicare benchmarking report, such as total spend, primary care visits, inpatient, post-acute care, ED visits. Um, and so we, we, we potentially do have a way of kind of verifying, um, verifying results across different report types so that um, they you know, feel more reliable or, or valid. Uh, again, this is a little more discussion on the reporting that OneCare produces to support providers. So in 2022, OneCare started providing quarterly consultations to each of its HSAs on the areas of care coordination, utilization, quality, and cost. Attendees vary between HSAs, <coughs> excuse me, and it's still evolving in 23. Typical attendees include hospitals, FQHCs, and other community organizations. There are two new reports that give practice level insights and payer agnostic views that were not previously available. This includes the primary care panel report, which includes panel composition, total cost of care, quality and utilization, as well as comparison to those of its peer group. Um, peer groups are provider or, or by provider or practice types, such as FQHCs, naturopaths, independent primary care. Um, critical access or, or non-critical access. The BIF reporting package includes multiple reports that were shared previously to providers, but now in a more streamlined manner. Um, and one of our questions, I think, around these provider reports, um, again, we know that OneCare uh, fielded a provider survey, which I believe results are, um, we do not have them at this time, but I think we're going to be finalized um, shortly or around this time of year. Um, and one of our questions here is, you know, here are the reports that are meant to um, uh, facilitate and, and provide useful and actionable data to providers. Um, we're interested to understand um, how providers perceive these and are, are using them and, and um, how, you know, their, their usefulness. Uh, 
Finally, I uh, want to discuss some, well, probably not finally, but next slide. Um, one care discuss uh, their self-evaluation efforts, which include care coordination evaluation, the provider survey that I just mentioned. I don't have on here the um, comprehensive payment reform program evaluation, but they do perform internal evaluations, which we uh, review or would like to review to better understand um, the impact uh, and the outcomes and results of these programs. There's some sort of high-level summaries here, but I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go through them. So key takeaways on this section. Um, the total population health management expenditures are $29.9 million. Um, most of that is uh, contractually obligated through their payer contracts, um, but about $10.3 million of it does fall in their entity level budget. Um, there is, you know, we, we, we've heard of there's been an evolution of the population health management payment model um, there has been phase out of some program support um, which was discussed in the hearing as you know programs that they provided startup funds for and now they're being transitioned to um, other uh, you know on ongoing support um, some have been phased out um, however the key thing here is that population health management investments so those are small amounts that that program support but the population health management investments are concentrated in the blueprint, advanced shared savings, and, and providing funding for that program. The population, sorry, the PMPM base and bonus payments and the CPR programs. So I kind of think of those, it's really their core population health management uh, investments. Um, there's the new care coordination reporting um, after the sensitive care navigator, and then again, um, ongoing ACO self evaluation. So the recommended approach on the population health section is uh, again to require one care to fund population health management and payment reform programs as detailed and to notify us of changes. They also report to us on this in the in the revised budget. This is consistent with past years. Um, the guidance we actually set a sort of a benchmark in the guidance that VBIF or other pre-funded clinical quality incentives are funded at at least 2.4 million dollars. Um, we would like reporting of self-evaluation results to the Green Mountain Care Board. And then the, that bullet, the last uh, dot there is um, the one that Sarah uh, Kinsler talked about in a prior section. Um, this, you, this is to require that the blueprint health um, payments are funded in the amount approved by the Green Mountain Care Board uh, with, under the Medicare ACO benchmark process. Um, and we are adding the addition of um, without passing risk associated with Medicare advanced shared savings payments onto the ACO network. Um, so this amount of risk in Medicare would drop to the um, one care entity level line on, if you adopt this recommendation. Um, and again, the one care budget proposes a 5.2% increase in the SASH and blueprint payments. Um, of which our recommendation is consistent. All right, performance measurement and improvement. Marissa, do you want me to take this intro or do you want to do nope. this intro? I, I got it. I think we consolidated, right? Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, it would, yeah, it's fine. Um, in this section, we're going to cover the history of the Green Mountain Care Board's approach to performance measurement and improvements and provide an overview of the FY22 budget order for the Medicare benchmarking report and a status update on the first report um, and end with the staff recommendations for an FY23 and FY24 approach. So quick history of the regulatory approach here back to 2018. Um, was the first time we included the condition that the healthcare savings must be greater than the operating expenses. In 2020, um, we requested an evaluation of the effectiveness of population health programs, as well as an HSA variation performance dashboard. In 21, um, we introduced a more consistent reporting manual for this reporting, um, and we again required the HSA variation performance dashboard. Those are, are posted on our website under those years. For 2022, um, we moved toward the benchmarking report recommendation. So the, the previous HSA variation report um, compared ACO practices to their peers within 
Vermont to look for variation. The benchmarking report um, compares the ACO to its peers nationally, um, specific to the Medicare program, because that is what data is available for. Um, and the purpose is to support our data-driven monitoring and oversight of OneCare while also supporting OneCare and identifying um, return on investment and areas of opportunity. Okay, so the board and the public are asking through this process, how do we measure success of OneCare? What data do we use to measure success? Um, this slide is specific to quality and financial measure results that are produced by the ACO or the payers. So external or third party evaluation will be addressed in the next section by Michelle Degree. So the suite of reports that we recommend the board rely on are on this slide. Um, so it includes quality and financial results, those are the annual payer contract scorecards, which were reviewed on November 21st. Um, those are those are backward looking. Um, the performance benchmark report, which was ordered by the board in last year's review, um, as well as some one care um, measurements that they discussed, the population health management framework measures and goals, and the KPIs being developed by one care and the University of Vermont. So I want to note when evaluating um, results, um, which we're not doing today, we're, we're sort of recommending the approach. But for even the highest performing ACO, we would expect to see mixed results in areas of high and low performance. But these measures will help guide our focus as regulators and should similarly guide OneCare's focus and investment. Um, there are other reports and evaluations mentioned in the OneCare submission or suggested by this board or I've, I've discussed already. Um, we can collect other evaluations for Green Mountain Care Board review through the reporting requirements. So we can ask them for, you know, CPR program evaluation, care coordination evaluation, or provider survey, um, as mentioned. Um, but if we're trying to select sort of a suite of reports um, to rely on, these are the ones that we recommend. Okay, so on this slide are the requirements of the performance benchmarking report that was ordered in FY22. This is directly from the budget order. Um, the staff have worked closely with OneCare all year as they developed this report, which we received um, in late October. Reviewing and approving vendor selection and report development. Um, the first report was, um, was just submitted. And at this time, um, our assessment is that they are uh, in compliance with the FY22 order. However, um, we have not had access directly to the vendor analyst and we continue to have concerns about the final methodology. So if you break this down, like A is around um, the methodology. We still have some questions there. However, they have provided a report to us and explained it and the methodology. Um, additionally, we need to understand how OneCare plans to use the report to satisfy B there, which is how you're going to take your results and turn them into an action plan. Um, specifically, how they use the results and identification of best practices from high performers to create an action plan. Um, we need to satisfy A and B before we are confident we can use the report for regulatory purposes. Are they doing these things? As stated at the beginning of this presentation, this approach was envisioned as a multi-year process when it was recommended. So we did get, we were originally supposed to get the report in July. We extended it to October. So we are um, somewhat delayed um, in, in being able to review the report, um, but we did always envision it as a multi-year approach. And just as a reminder, again, some board members are new, um, and as I mentioned before, um, this, this started last spring with a review of core competencies of high-performing ACOs, which led to the recommendation to implement performance benchmarking, um, which led to the development of the performance benchmarking report for one care, and the next step would be um, target setting um, and requirements for, for performance improvement plans. So I think it's a lot to try and absorb this report in this presentation, um, but I'm gonna just sum up our methodological concerns in two slides, and we're gonna return to interpretation of results late at, at a later date. So the report has um, from years 2019 to 2021, um, the benchmark cohort consists of 20 ACOs, making up about 700,000 lives. 
the cohort criteria includes ACOs with a two-sided risk model, high revenue ACOs, um, 20 to 80% of, of attributed beneficiaries live in urban zip codes, 40% or greater attributing specialists with patient panels, and less than 15% of attributed beneficiaries are duly enrolled for Medicaid. So this started with the full Medicare ACO um, nationally, which is 513 ACOs, I believe, and applying this criteria brought us down to 20 ACOs. Um, and then utilization and cost metrics were adjusted to account for risk scores um, and uh, unit cost adjustment. So significant limitation is in the call out box there and that one care in the contractor chose to identify a 90th percentile cohort rather than evaluating highest performers for each measure. So additionally, the small size of the cohort means that 90% percentiles is two ACOs, which sort of limits the ability to identify best practices. So essentially they took the, um, highest performing two ACOs in the cohort um, for cost measures and then and then compared um, one care to their performance for the 90th percentile, but then they've also supplied a, a median or 50th percentile, which compares one care to the average. Um, one care did include some high level interpretation in the full report, which is posted on the website. Um, and Again, this is just an example of the measures and the way the report looks. Um, people should, I, you know, I encourage people to take a look at that on the website. Um, but at this point, um, we're not ready to draw conclusions from the first benchmarking report due to remaining methodological issues, but we'd like to work these out in time for the budget guidance um, in the spring. And then just sort of in plain language, um, the Greenmount Care Board is seeking to answer certain questions from this data. Um, how does one care compare to the top performers in each category or metric? Um, in which categories does one care excel and in which categories does one care perform poorly? Um, in which categories metrics are one care results low cost or high quality? So where's their best performance and in which categories metrics are one cares results high cost or low quality? So the worst performance. Um, so essentially, what are the greatest areas of opportunity for One Care to make population health investments, and in which One Care Vermont investments are providing a return? I think I've covered this. Um, essentially, showing this was the this is a summary of the requirements, and um, you know, here's where we're at, and we're still working through this. Um, still working through this process. Um, I want to say um, that preliminary performance targets were included in section eight of the FY23 budget. So kind of our thinking of how we would, re would use this report was included in this year's guidance, um, but we want to refine that for 24. And again, I, I think we've probably covered this. Uh, great, okay. So the key takeaways um, on, on performance measurement and improvement. Uh, existing performance measurement does not satisfy all Green Mountain Care Board's requests for a certain assessment. So this, when I say Green Mountain Care Board requests, I mean things that have been in the budget order or things that have been discussed. Um, we wanted to, to sort of sum that up. Um, uh, board members and, and the public are looking for um, One Care Vermont patient and population outcomes at the ACO level um, compared to high performance targets and trends. Um, we are looking for uh, a way of calculating a return on investment on one care investments, including population health programs and administrative expenses, um, and a relationship between one care Vermont programs and investments and improved outcomes. So to the third point, uh, a definitive causal relationship on the ACO as an intervention may not be attainable because of the complexity of the intervention, but that doesn't mean we can't do robust analyses that will give us important information about one care's impact. So one care makes speculative claims that their interventions caused a specific outcome, um, but then they clarify that, this, that their goal is not to tie direct causation of one care activity to the particular outcome of, inter of interest. Um, we urge one care to be more cautious about inferring causation without providing high quality data to back up their claims. Um, but we do have some recommendations about analyses for the coming year, which um, Michelle will cover. Um, and again, this has been an ongoing conversation um, is included in the healthcare advocate comment as well. 
So finally on this section, the recommended approach um, is to build on the FY22 budget order by requiring improvements to benchmarking report. Um, and this includes identifying best performers and best practices, clarifying required methodology for the comparison to best performers. Um, we are would like to discuss a per measure comparison rather than identifying an individual high performing ACOs and comparing across measures. Um, we would like to discuss the capability to provide ROI calculation for areas of improvement. Um, and we are uh, interested in seeing a larger and more transparent comparison cohort. And we uh, recommend requiring one care to meet specific performance targets in FY24 guidance and to indicate how benchmarking report results drive PHM spending decisions. I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to discuss results to date. Thanks, Marissa. Just confirming you guys can hear me okay? Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, as Marissa said, I'm going to talk about three things today. Federal evaluation of the all-payer model by NORC, all-payer model scale targets, and a really quick overview of 2021 settlement, which we reviewed on November 21st, and Sarah um, and I have a duplicate slide, so we can probably skip pretty quickly. And I'll also note, I'm here to bring it home, so we're almost done. <laughs> Marissa, you can go to the next slide. We're going to start with an overview of the NORC federal evaluation. So NORC is contracted by CMMI to evaluate the model. This is a requirement of all federal models. Um, the focus of the evaluation is to assess the model's impact on the Medicare program and Vermont Medicare beneficiaries. So while there's correlation to ACO performance, this is not an evaluation of the ACO's performance. Just wanna make that clear. Um, Marissa, you can go to the next slide. Um, just linking the reports here for those interested in doing a deeper dive, each report includes the full evaluation report, which is lengthy. Findings at a glance and technical appendices. Those are all posted on our website and they are linked here for your convenience. Next slide. So this is a repeat slide from last year, but I wanted to sort of highlight it. So this is the first evaluation report. So that was performance years one and two, so 2018 and 2019. Um, these are the key findings that staff presented on during last year's budget presentation. Um, and some of these you'll see carry over into the second evaluation, which I'll talk about next. Um, so from the first year, we did see some positive takeaways, like overall reductions in Medicare spending and utilization for the entire Vermont Medicare population versus the comparison group. We saw improved cohesion around shared goals and collaboration across the state and realized some spillover effects into the full population beyond just Medicare beneficiaries. We also saw some opportunities, namely the lack of widespread understanding of the model and the recognition that transformation um, is gonna require a more robust transition to value-based payment and investment. Marissa, I can go to the next slide. So this is from the second evaluation report. So now we're looking at performance years one through three, so through 2020. Um, so highlighting some high level findings here of that second report, but also want to be fully transparent and recognizing that staff received this report about three business days ago. Um, so we've not had the opportunity to do a full deep dive, but plan to do so as soon as possible, uh, just being honest. Uh, in the second evaluation report, which now includes performance year three, 2020, we saw continued reductions in Medicare spending and utilization for the entire Vermont Medicare population and ACO attributed population versus the comparison group and continue to realize spillover effects into that full population. Not surprisingly, COVID response was the priority for providers and, and, um, and stated so in 2020 and 2021. So it's gonna carry over likely into next year's evaluation. Um, APM and ACO infrastructure and payment models really supported that public health emergency response, which we've heard about in the past. Um, the UVM cyber attack was noted in this evaluation report, um, which caused major challenges as, and is a confounding factor for analysis. It is also noted that continued lack of widespread understanding of the model. So kind of a carryover from, from the first evaluation. Marissa, you can go to the next slide. Moving into all pair model scale. Um, Sarah also touched on this earlier. So just to note that commercial <laughs> programs are typically finalized 
in um, the spring of the program year. Sorry, someone's not muted. <laughs> uh, so commercial programs are typically finalized in the spring of the performance year. Medicare and Medicaid must be executed by the 31st, so by the end of this month. Um, so we'll have that information by year's end. So what I'll show you has some of that information, um, but we'll wait until the revised budget to get the final results for some of that. Um, there's minimal concern, though, that the Medicare and Medicaid programs would fail to be scale target qualifying, so typically not worried about that aspect. Um, again, just want to note here that scale targets have been waived, but reporting and assessing the programs against that agreement criteria is still a requirement through the extension period, so we'll continue to report. Marissa, you can go to the next slide. So here's a glance at scale performance over time by payer contract. A few notes here. So we use prospective attribution obtained directly from Medicare and Medicaid for those first two rows. Um, so these numbers differ a little bit from what is in the initial budget proposal from one care. That makes sense and it's okay and we know that. Um, to highlight some takeaways, we're seeing growth in the Medicare and Medicaid space, both in the traditional and expanded cohort in Medicaid and a slight reduction in commercial across all programs. Uh, Marissa, you can go to the next one. As uh, Sarah mentioned, I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, Medicare Advantage penetration. So something we wanna continue to highlight, um, which you can see has been trending up since the beginning of the model for the current year, which is 2022, and that's only through August. That's the data that's available currently, or I should say when I pulled it, three days ago, so I hope it's still accurate. Um, we're seeing like nearly you know, 27.3, so nearly 30% of Medicare enrollees opting for these types of plans. It is very likely that we will see a similar increase in 2023 enrollments. Um, the impact here is kind of you know, just thinking overall about how um, the shift out of the traditional Medicare population impacts PMPM because the people that are left in traditional Medicare typically have a higher morbidity or risk score and therefore would have higher PMPM. Marissa, you can go to the next slide. Uh, it's freezing a little on my end. Hopefully we'll catch up. Okay. I can just, I can talk. Maybe it'll catch up. Um, so the yeah, there's a little, uh, the little spinning wheel saying that we're, our time's almost up. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to catch up or we'll reload it. Okay. Um, this slide you've actually already seen. Sarah presented it anyway. <laughs> um, so I'll just talk about it briefly and then hopefully it catches up. Um, so it's just a quick recap of the November 21st presentation. It's just a settlement result. Um, so approximately 8.2 million in shared savings earned and eligible for distribution, which again excludes the shared savings advance in the Medicare program, which Sarah talked about. So I will not repeat it. And I'll wait for Marissa to try to reshare. I'm reloading it. And now we'll be on slide 103, if that's helpful. Still getting a spinning wheel. So I'm gonna stop it and try another way. I apologize. Sarah, do you want to try taking it in case this doesn't load? For board members who are here, you might recall that I'm always the one who breaks it. So this has happened before. <laughs> Not the first time. Why don't we do this? Why don't we take a five minute break so people see so you have a minute and um, we'll come back at 3.05 and uh, we'll see how we're doing, okay? All right, so we're, we're adjourned for five minutes to 3.05. Thank you. Okay, we are back and it looks like it's working. Uh, so I'll take it away. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks for the patience with troubleshooting. Um, so uh, reviewing quickly again, the 2021 results that we talked about on November 
first. Um, we saw mixed results here, so that's sort of irrespective of scoring methodology used. If you look at the actual performance, we saw some mixed results in the final quality metrics, um, some increases and some decreases in all of the programs that presented. And I also just want to point out that while we do now have four points in time, comparability is going to continue to be a challenge given several factors. First being the difference in the Medicare program quality framework in 2018. So essentially we have three points of time in the Medicare program where all of the same metrics were used, two of those having been reverted to paper reporting due to the public health emergency. Um, we have a, introduction of Medicaid expanded attribution and of course COVID public health emergency um, which led to a change in pay for reporting versus pay for performance in a lot of the programs. Um, additionally just a, another um, point I always like to remind folks of is that we have to consider scale growth in each program over time and the potential impacts that growth might have on payer program results. Marissa you can go to the next one. Key takeaways. Uh, so, there it is. Uh, so, scale enforcement has been waived, but we'll continue to report and assess programs for compliance. Um, also, just again, another note that scale achievement is not necessarily a reflection of ACO performance, but it is reflecting many factors, including care and insurance market patterns, continued growth in that Medicare Advantage space. Um, and again, we expect to see that continue. Pair performance continues to vary in both savings earned and in quality performance. And then as Marissa mentioned earlier, it's really challenging to identify causal results due to complexities of ACO programming in the overall state healthcare environment, the continuing impacts of COVID-19 and national trends. Marissa, next slide. So with that, the recommended approach here, um, staff recommend requiring one care to complete an ROI analysis, comparing their administrative expenses to healthcare savings, including an estimate of cost avoidance and the value of improved health. This is consistent with past budget orders, which have required that this be done over the duration of the AAPM agreement, of which the original term ends this December 31st, 2022. So we're asking one care to conduct their five-year analysis of the original agreement term in this recommendation. Um, although already required by rule, the GMCB staff want to ensure access to data required to conduct any analyses um, that the board staff want to do at sort of a staff level also. So just flagging that we're calling out rule 5501 here um, just to make sure that one care complies with any and all data requests to aid in that analysis. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Marissa. That concludes our staff slides uh, and um, review preliminary recommendations on the budget. Um, so I am just a reminder, we have several deliberative sessions and a, and a vote um, by the end of the year. And I will uh, turn it over to you, Chair Foster, for board discussion and questions. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, are there any board questions or comment? Chair, this is this is Tom Walsh. I have a couple. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, first, thank you to the staff. This um, just an incredible amount of information that you've provided. It's going to take uh, at least me. It's going to take a few days to digest it. Um, the, I have a couple questions, a, a, a handful of questions. Um, they're basically broad strokes. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding things well. Um, <clears throat> And if I ask something and somebody doesn't have the, the answer right away, that's completely fine. Um, this is just to help me understand um, uh, things better. So um, I want to start. I wrote down some slide numbers as we went, um, if it helps orient people. But I thought it was really helpful to go through the breakdown on slide 14 with the with the diagram. Um, the total amount of healthcare spending um, on um, Vermonters uh, from that diagram was $6.5 billion, 6.4, um, which is a lot, but about 1.5 of that is um, patients who have been attributed to One Care Vermont, if I've read, if I've paid attention well. 
And so by the time we get all the way out there to the left, we're talking about a, a 1.5 billion as opposed to 6.5 billion. Is that, do I have that correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and so then um, if I followed, it uh, gets broken down further into um, the one care broadly, but then one care um, as an entity. That was a few a few slides later around slide um, 29 through 39 in that section. I think the the point that I took away from it, and I want to just double check, is that the proportion of funds that focus specifically on the one care entity um, ends up being in the $25 million range. You want, you want me to um, clarify or, or speak to that? Yes, so the, the $25 million um, is the um, entity level amount. So these are uh, funds that are not obligated through the payer contracts. That is mostly um, the revenues and expenses for administrative costs and the operations of one care. So the, the 15.2 and a portion about 10 million um, is in the population health management program. Um, the total population health management spending is 29.9 million. Um, but most of that is is contractually obligated through payer contracts. So it still represents investments in population health, but only about 10 million of that remains sort of more at the discretion of 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 one care. Okay, that that helps. Thank you. Um, these this flow is complicated, so please um, bear with me while I try to figure it out. the The 25 million, the entity level, um, does that include dollars for data analytics? The dollars for data analytics that are included in their uh, administrative costs, contracted services, software, yes, is in that 15 million. Okay. And and how about the blueprint and SASH funds? The blueprint for SASH funds is in the total accountability population health management budget. So that is contractually obligated as part of the 29 million in population health investments. One one care administers those payments, um, but they pay them out according to the budget order and the agreement with Medicare. So we, we've had some um, public comments suggesting that that funding could just simply be removed from one care and put in um, AHS, but that's that wouldn't be a simple thing to do. Um, and if it were done, that money is going to providers to provide care. It's not going to support one care operations. Is correct. that correct? It is the mechanism by which those Medicare investments um, are uh, paid to providers and the blueprint. So I think it's I think it's fair to say that one care is the fiduciary agent of the dollars. They 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 take the Medicare dollars. Um, and distribute them and to the blueprint. So removing that from removing that fiduciary responsibility from one care um, would not alter the entity specific twenty five million that we've we've come to understand. Uh, correct. It is not included in the twenty five million. Mar Marissa and Tom, if I might add, we, uh, the state of Vermont has worked with Medicare to discuss other potential ways of bringing that Medicare funding for the blueprint, um, you know, PCMH, CHT payments, as well as the SASH program uh, into Vermont. And we have not been able to find another mechanism that's workable for, for Medicare. So while we recognize that this, um, that, that the advanced shared saving me savings mechanism um, is, is somewhat complicated. Um, it's kind of the mechanism that we um, have got uh, to, to continue to have Medicare invest in those foundational programs uh, that have been positively evaluated. 
So, so that's very helpful because that sounds like if we were to try to do it a different way, Medicare may just simply not pay us. We need we need a I different if, contractual if, relationship if, with if, Medicare. If we precisely like if if we want if we want to be able to bring these Medicare dollars into Vermont, this is the way that we that we can do it. For now, like we could get a new a new arrangement, but that would be that's going to take time, and needs a willing partnership with Medicare. Okay, um, that helps me a lot. Um, so thanks for bearing. I see Robin shaking her head like she, she knows this, um, <laughs> but it's I'm getting up to speed. So um, I want to ask some questions about the risk model. Um, and it seemed to me this is it. My questions start on slide 57. It, it might help to to go there if we can without breaking the internet. Nice. So here it, it, it looks like the vast majority of risk with these contracts is held by the provider, the providers. And that risk has grown over the, the um, life of the ACO entity. Meanwhile, one cares assets have grown. Am I interpreting this table correctly? Yes. So there's there's probably some nuances here which maybe at one point we we, we would want one care to clarify, but from the information that we have. Um, there it was a board order 3.9 million of reserves in 2019. Those assets grew to 5.6 in 2020. Our understanding from the audited financials from 21 is that they have grown further. However, I do not believe that those have necessarily been set aside specifically as reserves. Um, I, I, I would um, want one care to speak to those. So that's what we see in the audited financials. In their 2022 projections and 23 information, they have that level remaining at the 2020 level. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I'm going to leave it at that and would probably defer okay. to OneCare for further clarification. Okay. But they're, they have so, grown somewhat since the board ordered. They have grown since the board ordered reserves. I, I think I can. And, and again, I understand causality is is difficult and and assessing the relationship between changing numbers is difficult. Um, their assets have grown or at worst stayed the same while their risk with these contracts has declined. The risk bearing uh, amount that one care has held has declined while the risk to providers has grown by it's a roughly a 10% swap since 2019 is is that correct you want to take this there or me sure sure um that's correct tom i think we all recognize that the pandemic has brought extraordinary circumstances. It is, it's not so, I, I think it's not surprising and it is appropriate that there would be some decrease to risk during kind of the roughest period of the pandemic and I guess late pandemic, uh, early post pandemic after effects, um, you know, the challenging times that we've seen our, our healthcare providers and especially the ACO's risk bearing entities in. So it, it makes a lot of sense to me that, uh, risk went down in the 2020 post COVID budget and 21 and in 22. Um, I, I think we're um, heartened to see that kind of coming back up to near pre COVID levels in 23. So while, you know, risk to, took a significant dip, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't look as much at the total risk level. I think in terms of one care risk, you're absolutely right. Um, as I mentioned, uh, when we talked through this slide, one of the big factors uh, in one care taking on risk for providers 
um, in, in earlier years in particular had been uh, as a way to help providers join a new payer program. So in particular, it, it, it's been used as a way to help providers join the Medicare ACL initiative if they're not quite up uh, to taking on kind of the full risk amount that would be delegated to them based on one care's methodology and their attribution, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in that first year. So, so that that kind of has been what they have used the one care health risk for. Um, as you'll note, staff are recommend, recommending that one care actually take on a significant increase in risk uh, in 23 um, in our recommendations for them to take on the risk associated with the blueprint uh, and that advanced shared savings methodology. So, um, so you know, you are you are seeing an increase uh, in net assets and equity here, uh, but we're recommending a significant increase over that 874 K. OK, that, that's helpful and a little just some more context that hasn't been pro provided here. Um, many high performing ACOs across the country assume 100% of the downside risk. And many newer ACOs use that as a feature of their business model. They are so confident that they'll be able to achieve these savings and hit the quality marks that they assume 100% of the risk, the providers have none. Because they want to stick a pin in that. Um, could we go to slide 73, please? Oh, that's probably not the one I wanted. <laughs> the, I'm interested, I was, I'm trying to follow the um, population health payments, um, the provider reporting. Some of those things, as we've received more um, evidence, it seems that some of those responsibilities may be shifting to the UVM health network. And I don't yet understand what that means for OneCare's budget. Does that money leave OneCare? Do they still uh, do they still need as much in dues from, from um, participating hospitals? What does that mean from a budget standpoint? Um, like the, the sunset of the care navigator, for example. And um, do these thing, how do these things affect the budget? So the overall effect that one care testifies to is that it is budget neutral, that the buckets of money to that pay for these things are transitioning from you know in-house analytics and software to to contracted services like i think matt mentioned we did ask them for more detail about those specific contracts and pieces of software of which some of it is deemed confidential so we did not provide that here um i i i do think the movement within the budget um we um may need to discuss in a in a way that we can look at the confidential information. Um, but then I also think that some of this discussion will be in part of the um, monitoring um, investigation that Russ discussed. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so the, I'll hold off on more till we have those meetings. The, the goals here on this slide, the statistic, demonstrate statistically significant improvement for all measures. I think it's on the next slide or maybe slide 78, it lists the measures. Right, so if I'm to under, so child and adolescent well visits as a measure, that sounds like it will be the count of how many occur. If 100, well visits occurred in 2002, how many occur in 2023? Or if we went from one well visit in year one to two visits in year two, we would we could, if we were promoting ourselves, claim a 100% improvement. Th these are counts. Is, is that correct?
I think a deferred discussion about how those particular measures work to one care themselves, or if the, if if Michelle or someone else is more familiar with these measures wants to answer that. Um, but I would rather not. That I understand. I'm not. I'm not trying to give anybody a hard time. I'm trying to understand what this this means. It it seems like for follow up after hypertension diagnosis, that would be a yes or a no. Right. And so then I'm trying to think through what would be a statistically significant improvement. And while I like the goals and I like the words used. These seem like a very low bar. So I, I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But yep, let's noted, just noted. Come back yeah, to I think it. I think the reason for the recommendation or why we have sort of a suite of reports is that we're trying to collect information that that one care already collects and measures and see if that is sufficient to meet your needs. And yes. if, if you're not, then that's part of the discussion. But this was one identified area that we could look at um, yep. in a um, you know a suite of reports. Yep. Um, and, and there's some overlap with Medicare reports. Medicare reports several of these already without needing any analysis from One Care or UVM Health Network. Is that correct? This would be. Hey, sorry, Marissa. Hi, Tom. Uh, Hi. This would be for the full ACO population, not specific to just Medicare attributed lives. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that was kind of silly. So this I mean. is, so, thank you. That's okay. So that's the full population. So, and yes, there's a lot of overlap here um, with all pair model measures in total and payer specific all pair model measurement. Um, or sorry, pair specific contract measurement, not all pair model measurement. Um, so there is a significant amount of overlap with these measures. Okay, okay. Um, I don't need to ask that. Um, on slide 82, um, there's talk of phasing out the blueprint and CPR. What, help me understand what that means here and what that would mean to the budget. Sorry. Yeah, that might be a confusing, that is a confusing bullet point. So um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, there's a phase out of some program support, which I think you can see on one of Matt's slides um, that some of the smaller amounts um, in uh, dual stay or some of, the, of these other programs, I have to look to remember what they are. Those, those are being phased out once you're discussed that. Um, what this means is that the, the PHM investments are actually concentrated in the blueprint the PMPM base and bonus payments in the CPR programs. Those are their core investments. There are some other investments that are smaller, some of which are being phased out. I see now that that um, particular uh, bullet point there on the slide is misleading, so might correct that. Just, yeah, when you have it the way you think that it's best, let me know so that I, under, I, I can understand. Um, Takeaway so, is that so, those are the core program population health investments, the blueprint, the PMPM payment, and the CPR. That that comprises the bulk of the population health management investments. Okay. Um, could we go to slide 88, please? Um, and and he, so here, um, could you help me understand the limitation of choosing the 90th percentile as a comparison group, does that mean they're comparing themselves to the top 10%? Or am I missing this? And I, I do understand that that choice substantially limits the comparison group. I get what it does to the sample size, but um, help me understand any other limitations, please. Okay. So let me let me try, and then someone else can 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 jump in if I don't have it. So the way they constructed the report of the 20 ACOs, they identified the top 90th percentile, which is two ACOs on two measures. I don't think I have it on the slide, but it's total cost of care. I think so. Basically, the the highest performing ACOs on cost, and they said these are the highest performing ACOs in the cohort. And then each individual measure, they compared one care's performance. 
to those two ACOs. So that when we saw that, that was not our understanding of how this perform, report was going to be performed. Our understanding is that we were going to get the top performers by each category um, and then understand who's performing best on each measure. So we are still working out that, that the choice behind that um, and if um, it can be performed the other way. We did not feel like we had all of our questions satisfied on why this methodological choice was made. Right. Well, it's a good it's a good catch. Um, so thank you for getting it because the, it's unlikely that the top the same two ACOs are the top performers across every measure. Correct. Yeah. So that's a very important thing to <laughs> fix. Yeah, we agree um, completely, Tom. Um, that that was something that we noticed as well. Uh, one. Really, what we were looking for in requiring, you know, seeing the 90th percentiles, we want to get a sense for each of the measures in the report. What is, what's the ceiling? What's a reasonable ceiling to expect? Um, so, you know, rather than just looking at kind of two ACOs that are high, high performing on cost, we're looking for a measure by measure um, understanding of like what what is high really high performance look like. Please keep pushing. It's good catch on your part and. Um, please, um, slide 103, please. This is for the, the quality scores. Um, and one, I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, I think it's very clear. The words are here, but when we start showing quality scores and seeing 100%, that looks like high quality, but by reading the words in addition to the numbers, most of these 100% mean they submitted 100% of the data, not that they achieved any benchmark. And when there are opportunities to look at benchmarks, those numbers are in the 85 to 90, 95% range in 2018 and 2019. But the only recent one we have is the one I cited in our last meeting on this topic, and that's with the Medicaid group, and there the score is less than 70%. So I, I want to make sure that I understand that, and I want to make sure that anybody listening understands that. Um, we did calculate the Medicare score in all years outside of like what it would have been if it weren't reporting only. And that was presented on November 21st, all in there. Um, but per their, this is per like what is in their contract, this is the result that one care earned. Um, yep. And so that's what we're presenting here. But yes, you're correct. We did calculate it outside of that parameter. Yes. Yep. Um, and then slide 105, last, last thing. Um, how many times has OneCare been asked to provide this ROI analysis? It's been in the budget order since 2019. However, um, it is also written over the duration of the agreement. So, um, you could interpret it to mean what at the at the at the conclusion of the agreement, please provide this. Um, but it has been asked and been in the budget order since since 2018. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Four or five times. Um, okay. Um, I would like to oops, oh, so sorry, Tom. No go. I, I would like to clarify on that point. We haven't um, we have said that our expectation is that over the full, you know, five years of that original agreement, um, that that condition would be met. But we haven't actually asked um, for an analysis. So, by, you know, we've we've looked into whether there might be a compliance issue on this condition. We don't believe that there is a compliance issue on this condition. Okay. So I think, um, you know, Russ, if you have anything to add to that and you want to jump in, please feel free to. But um, but it, but, you know, if there's a compliance issue, we can remediate a compliance issue. But I think in this case, um, the the ask has not been, you know, provide us this analysis this year. Uh, now it will be. 
Um, so, okay. you know, we're we're saying, you know, the original five year term of the agreement uh, is concluding and we would like to um, we would like to to see an analysis uh, and we want to make sure additionally that we have a chance to um, discuss the potential methodology or proposed methodology for that analysis uh, and for the board to kind of have a have a bite at that apple. So um, so that's something that, you know, staff are, are proposing in our recommended approach to say, OK, it's been in the original term of the agreement is up. Um, let's let's better understand how you would like to do this uh, and and discuss the specifics and then let's get some initial analysis. Great, thank you for setting me straight. I had misinterpreted that, so that that's exactly why I asked the questions. Um, and I know being asked questions about your work for anybody that's it's stressful, and having that happen in public is really stressful. And so just thank you for for putting up with me. Um, and doing this in public, it, it's the way we have to, the way we have to. Um, so I'm sorry that it's stressful, but thank you very much for the work you've done. I know you've put in a lot of hours and thank you for answering my um, extra questions. Our pleasure, thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Merman, do you have any questions or comments? Sure. Um, I really appreciate a lot of, I mean, your Tom's comments and questions and my God, the amount of work you've done, uh, the team on putting this together and digesting it and presenting it is is amazing. I know uh, I've gone through the binder, but you guys have gone beyond that. So thank you so much. Um, I guess I, I have a few comments and a few questions. And one of them I think is just between the last several hearings, trying to come to understanding what what to expect one care um, to do. And I think that's something I've been struggling with. And I think there's a lot of ideas about one care, what one care can do um, and what one care is capable of doing. And I think, you know, the, I guess the, a lot of the things that were discussed in their presentation, uh, I've been trying to, to understand. One of them is cost. Um, and I think that I've come to the conclusion, at least at this point, that um, in the current model that we have, that it's not going to be a profound change in cost that might move it a percent or two this way, but and that most of the cost reduction strategies are going to be through uh, long term improvements in quality and through the gains from care coordination activities and reducing um, un, um, possibly preventable uh hospitalizations and, and ed visits it, is that sound kind of reasonable are those the main cost reducing activities that they have that sounds accurate to me okay and then quality um again um i think that from my understanding uh, that the major quality initiatives are uh, tra tracking these various metrics that we've been tracking and uh, and reporting on them, which um, which it's uh, uh, providing data to providers to figure out if they are providing good quality care. Um, again, the care coordination component, and I think I think I think that's the majority of the quality stuff. Is is there something I'm I'm missing that they major components that they do that provides potential improvements in quality of care? Um, I mean, that I mean, that sounds right too. They do have um, and are required to have a quality improvement plan. I forget what the actual term is that yeah. they use or that is in the in the rule. Um, but um, but yes, they are required to report on progress uh, on that plan. And I think member member Walsh was bringing up the quality improvement questions in the more, more recent hearing that I think I think maybe maybe we could try to figure out if we can get some insight into what those plans look like. I, it sounded it was unclear to me whether how they're defined. I, it was there was a lot of conversation on that, but I don't know where we finally settled. Um, one area that I think that seems to come up as a as a real benefit of one care from uh, primary care providers is the CPR payments and the sustainability of that 
provided for them through the course, especially of the pandemic and going forward. So I think that's that's one component of one care that I don't think I understood prior to these hearings that it seems quite impactful to to the healthcare system. And then also the funds flow of care coordination dollars um, seems seems uh, impactful, but but it also doesn't seem necessarily unique to to the one care structure that this could go through potentially some future agreements with Medicare, different directions, but that would be Medicare dollars. Um, and then the last thing that they, in the end of the presentation that I think OneCare sort of seemed to define itself by as being a, a data analytics organization and providing um, high quality data analytics to provider organizations to help improve their practices. And so I think that seemed to be a focus of where OneCare um, is, is going. So that was just sort of, I just want to sort of summarize my my sort of understanding of the organization and and uh, here if, if if anybody has any thoughts if that seems like a a reasonable summary of what their kind of core capabilities and services are i didn't hear anything that sounds wrong but again i don't think okay. these are all directed at me so <laughs> yeah well you're the one answering which is wonderful but i don't know thank you other um, board members or other staff please uh, I, 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 so I agree with I would like to continue to um, understand this uh, data analytics contract with the UVM Health Network and and I know um, this is an area that the healthcare advocate has concerns and I think I voiced concerns recently and, and try to understand the relationship between OneCare and UVM and the data contract um, and so I, I appreciate um, Rest the efforts to maybe move that into a separate, um, a separate investigation. Um, Tom covered a lot of what I was interested, in, so I don't want to go on too long. I guess one of the one of the things that I'm trying I'm struggling with in all the benchmark data and the NORC data is what and and this gets into sort of the complex issues of causality and correlation, but I think. I feel like there could be more um, clarity here is 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 trying to understand what the impact of one care is and and uh, and how that relates to say to patients who are attributed to one care or not one care or patients who are attributed to one care over time in these um, quality metrics that we've been following and and I don't think I've felt like I've had great understanding and insight into um, what we think is one care. And I think also we talk about the spillover effect. Is it things spilling to one care or spilling from one care? Vermont has sort of unique healthcare delivery structures. Um, and so I, I don't know if I, I don't think I've been satisfied yet in trying to understand what is the one care effect and how we can, and, and, and how we can understand what their impact is into the delivery systems of healthcare and what is just Vermont healthcare, because like we are, we're a really cost-effective Medi Medicare state, and and we do things a lot differently here as a population than than many other states. So, um, again, not really a question, more an observation. I think the only other um, question that I think I would like to ask at this time is a question on slide. 57. We don't have to go to the slide, but this is one cares assets. Um, and this 5.7 million dollars in assets. Do we have any idea where these assets are held? Like how is this? Are they held by one care or are they held by their parent organization? Great question, um, board member Merman, and one that I would have to defer to our finance team uh, if they have the answer, or we can get back to you next week um, when you reconvene and deliberate on this. But it may be that Matt or Flora or Sarah Lindbergh can answer that off the top of their head. Matt here, I don't know offhand, so I'm happy to get back to you with that though. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible amount of work to go through this, and I really appreciate the presentation and clarity. Ms. Lunge, do you have any questions or comments? Thanks. Um, I have a couple. Uh, 
first of all, of course, thank you to our staff. As always, you guys have done an amazing, terrific job um, marshalling all of this data and information and the reams of information that you have to process is incredible. So thank you. Um, I had a question about the decline in the Medicare uh, total cost of care dollars. At, and I was curious if we know what's driving that, if that's related to the Medicare Advantage penetration or something else. And if we're not sure, obviously, please uh, follow up at later. Can you direct us to a I, slide? No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write down the slide I, number. I am. Uh, it was in, I think, one of Matt's slides. OK. I can see if I can find it. Off the top of my head, I, I couldn't answer, um, you know, accurately about the drivers for that, not having something to look at. So maybe that's something that we can touch back on next week unless totally. Matt uh, or the finance team wants to jump in. I think let's to just take it, you know, later. No worries. I was just curious about that and we may not be able to follow that that ball, but with the Medicare Advantage penetration growing, um, it's just interesting to see how that flows through to the financials. Um, I had, then I had a couple of comments that um, actually came out of our meeting in Rutland, uh, but actually do dovetail, I think nicely with some of Dave's comments. I was, I thought it was interesting um, a couple of different things from the Rutland presentation that really, to me, potentially explain some of the spillover effect that we see in the evaluations. Um, specifically, when we when we were talking to the community health team, they call it the Accountable Community for Health, the Blueprint Community Health Team, uh, they were talking about the implementation of the Medicaid expanded ACO program in their community, which is done through the Blueprint Community Health Team, and how when they are doing outreach to those patients without primary care providers, they don't just limit it to ACO attributed folks, they basically do it with anyone. And so um, I just thought that was interesting because one of the areas that I think we've discussed uh, for many years is to Dave's point, in a state where we've had a long history of the blueprint for health, the medical homes and the community health teams, and where we have statutorily required that the ACO not duplicate but instead use those structures for implementation of any of their programs, I think it can be quite difficult to disentangle what's the blueprint versus what's one care. Um, and that was just kind of an interesting example. Um, and to me, um, maybe if it is widespread and more than just this HSA, uh, explains why we see this spill over more broadly, because from the community perspective, they may just be implementing it across the board, regardless of attribution, at which point you would see any impacts in the population more generally. So th that was just an anecdote I wanted to share. And then um, to your COVID-19 slide, again, a story from Rutland's that was interesting to that really highlighted starkly for me, not being a clinician, uh, some of the impacts from COVID and the difficulty kind of regrouping um, was that the place that I visited was the Westridge Center, which is a substance abuse uh, disorder treatment center. And they, prior to the pandemic, ran, I think they said over 60 different like in-person group um, groups for their 400 patients. And so they are obviously a very high touch organization that completely went away during COVID and they haven't been able to reestablish those 60 groups. So what that kind of highlighted for me that maybe some of what we're seeing in the 2021 quality and other um, sort of issues is that we know from our hearings during the pandemic that basically healthcare reform activities were put on the back burner, understandably, because people were dealing with the pandemic. And so I, I don't think there's an answer to this question, but I think it'll be interesting to see how quickly uh, that comes back. Uh, because the, the ACO, since the implementation of the programs is, to Dave's point, providers, uh, is going to be, they're 
their success is very much tied to when the delivery system is sort of recovered enough from the pandemic to be able to reconvene their healthcare reform um, and delivery system reform activities. So those were just a, since I know most of you were working hard on this presentation, it was just a couple of anecdotal examples that I thought kind of highlighted some of the challenges um, that we see with some of the data and wanted to share those with you. Um, and that is really actually um, related to that, the blueprint issue, I, I was wondering if it might make sense uh, when we get the care coordination evaluation to share that with the Blueprint for Health, since the implementation of care coordination goes through the Blueprint for Health community health teams, just to see if they had any um, comments or thoughts on that. Um, so I was going to suggest that. And also, if you, I wanted to ask if you had shared um, any of the recommendations that touch more directly to the Blueprint programs with AHS in case they had any uh, thoughts. We did talk with um, Eden Backus, the director of healthcare reform, uh, about the overall um, blueprint CHT SASH trend uh, for that one care is proposed for this year. Uh, we also spoke with her um, about the um, our re recommendation related to um, the risk related to the advanced shared savings dollars, uh, and I believe also the Medicaid FPP target was discussed with Diva. Great, thank you. I just wanted to make sure those communication loops were flowing. Yeah, um, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Great, right. Ms. Holmes. Thank you. Um, I just have one comment, actually, and one quick question. I think um, my comment is is broadly around evaluation, and I think you know we've had public comment, we've had board concerns about how we you know better evaluate the impact uh, of One Care Vermont on Vermonters. And you know we get lots of data, we have reports, um, but sometimes it's hard to navigate all these different uh, measures and, and try and attribute causality. Uh, so I just wanted to throw out there to the staff that perhaps we might need to do our own internal assessment where we compare the costs and the health outcomes for a continuously enrolled ACO attributed population with an otherwise matched sample, uh, you know, a matched sample of otherwise similar uh, patients who have never been enrolled in the ACO and look at them over time. And I just so I just want to throw out there that that may be something that we explore doing um, in the coming months and we may need some data from one care to do that. But we also have um, some of our own, you know, databases that would allow us to do such an analysis. So I want to throw out there that I think I'd like to see if that's something feasible. Um, and then I, my other, my question really was the recommendation by staff to request uh, One Care Vermont to submit the methodological approach to conducting that ROI analysis, comparing their admin expenses to the um, healthcare savings. And I just wondered if the staff had considered or would consider the feasibility of thinking about providing some sort of frame, framework or guardrails or expectations for what that methodology looks like so that we can ensure that we're getting what we want. And so my guess I would just, maybe we can think a little bit harder in the next week. Uh, I'll do that and maybe others can as well. Of what, what would we, you know, what are some of the expectations we might have for that methodology so that when if if that's something that the board approves when when one care submits it in april it's really truly what we want and what we're expecting and what we need so that's just a question which you can we can talk about next week if if that's better or if somebody has a thought on that today that'd be great next week's great <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we're all like, uh, un unmuting and waiting to see uh, if someone else is going to jump in the, the challenge of having um, a large team. Um, I think that that's something that we should definitely discuss uh, internally as staff and, and with you, um, Board Member Holmes. Um, I, we would certainly want to bring in um, staff from our, our data team and make sure that our data team was able to kind of help us uh, help us think through the options. Um, I think that there are also potential opportunities uh, to work with the Blueprint for Health on this um, per board member Lunge's earlier um, earlier comment uh, and, and to see whether 
um, we could collaborate with them since it is going to be challenging. You know, there's there's potential for it to be really challenging to disentangle the blueprint uh, and and one care interventions, among others. That's all I have, Chair Foster. Thank you, and thank you, team. Again, a lot of work, a lot of slides, a lot of analysis, and very much appreciated. I believe Dr. Merman had one other additional question. If you if you would like to go, Doctor, go ahead. Oh, thanks so much. You know, uh, just one quick comment. I think, um, Jessica, I really like the idea of of that matched control study. I do think it, one thing to consider maybe is that the penetration of medic of one care is so high that finding appropriate match controls um, might be challenging. Just, but but I, I I really like. I think it's the kind of stuff I think we need to do. But my my question was actually on. Um, uh, one quick question on uh, executive and ACO compensation that came up is uh, I was reviewing the rules and our rule says an ACO must structure its executive compensation to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's effort to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. And so um, I think one thing that I would like to see if we could obtain this from one care is those specific and measurable goals. The, the slide that uh, was presented on executive compensation has um, really good conceptual framework, I believe, for the compensation. But um, I would think that if if there are, I would think there's probably specific and measurable components to that that would be very helpful to see just to confirm that the compensation is in line with uh, those efforts to reduce costs and improve quality. So I guess my question in that is, uh, could we request that? I think that was a part of our next steps um, in in forming conclusion on that, on meeting that particular requirement. Thanks. Um, I just had a couple um, on slide 88 about the, you know, I don't think you need to go to it, but the issue with the methodology. Um, when did we learn about the methodology being different than we had anticipated? And had we communicated our expectation that it should be top performers by each category? That's a, a good question. I would have to look and see specifically which meeting we learned that. Um, I do think it was earlier this fall. Um, and we've read, reread our language requirements multiple times. Um, it did come a bit as a surprise to us, um, but also it was, it's, it, you know, it's challenging to get the specifications just right in the language. Um, so we've had an iterative process with, with them, um, but I would, I would say that we, we didn't learn this till a bit later in the process, but I, I don't want to say exactly when, because I don't have my meeting notes in front of me. I don't know if this is feasible or appropriate, but if if it is, would it be possible to participate in the methodology development process so that we don't have that problem in the future? Um, and in particular, with regard to the slide 105 information about the ROI for the program long um, results, I, I don't want to have that. I don't want it to be delayed yep. and then have some issue where, you know, here we are again. That's something we'd like to explore. We, like I said in my remarks, we didn't. We had staff level conversations. We did not have analyst to analyst um, conversations, and I think to avoid that kind of confusion or surprises, um, we may need to have um, closer conversations with the people actually, you know, um, doing the data analysis, as opposed to having it sort of channel through. <laughs> Um, staff. Yeah, that would strike me as beneficial, um, especially given some of the delays that have happened and the long running um, budget order on the slide 105. Um, and I think I got this right, but what that means is if we actually look at that benchmarking report, theoretically, 
the ACOs that they're being compared to on any particular category could actually be, you know, in the first percentile. And then one care be being compared really to a floor on any particular, theoretically, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I will say that, so, again, I want to speak for them, but one care doesn't actually recommend being compared to that 90th percentile group for that reason. They say that they do their overall results based on the median, but that is not exactly what we asked for. We were looking for high performers, not average performers. So that's why we're that's why we're here. We feel like we're not getting the high performance piece, but they uh, agreed with that. Cause when you look at those 90th percentile measures, some of them are lower than the median for that reason. And so that doesn't make, make sense, but yeah. And if I could add to that, Marissa, I, I think we benefit um, as we work with one care or, or we hope to work with one care to refine the benchmarking report methodology um, to, to kind of address this issue, Chair Foster, in part so that we can so that we can see a median. I think seeing a median is is appropriate and important to say, you know, our uh, is one care, you know, in the top half or in the bottom half, um, but also knowing kind of what the ceiling is, as you know, you say not not what a floor is that that will be really important. Um, I could see us using uh, those measures and and in particular the median um, as thing you know for think for purposes like performance benchmarking in the future um, where we actually are setting targets uh, in in ACO guidance um, as as we kind of suggested so I think um, you know that this gives us a sense that uh, you know if one cares just slightly above the median but they're actually very clo close to the 90th percentile like it it gives us a sense of what the range is I think for any given measure. Really beneficial. I don't think they necessarily should be held to the 90th percentile in every category across the board. That'd be outstanding, but I think that's a very high bar. However, I think seeing where there is more runway for improvement and seeing if those are areas where we have particular issues in Vermont would be very beneficial. I don't think the goal is to say if you're not hitting 90th percentile, you're a failure. It's to see where we can really target resources or where they can target resources to have the most impact um, for Vermonters. So I think that would be beneficial to have it as you had um, suggested as uh, by each category. Um, I didn't have anything else and you guys know I appreciate this very much. So I won't echo everyone else, but thank you all. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I uh, uh, will be very, very brief. I, I also I, I want to thank the board staff uh, and the board for really doing due diligence here. Um, you, you know, uh, yes, the presentation is important, um, but also there's a tremendous amount of work that's gone into the, this whole effort and and uh, also recognizing the board questions and, and focus here. Um, uh, the HCA has an opportunity. We're, you know, we are pushed to write our our thoughts down in advance, and we did. We made our comments, um, and um, there's no reason to repeat any of those. Uh, we stand by them, uh, and uh, and thank you for your work. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Um, unless anyone else on the healthcare advocate team has any questions or comments, um, I'll turn it over to public comment, which will be via the raise your hand function. And I'll call on folks in the order in which um, their hands are raised. Walter, how are you? Um, good to see you. Um, please go ahead. Hey, Owen, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, we, we missed you. I know, I missed you too. <laughs> what do I do without my weekly dose of the Green Mountain Care Board? Well, we doubled down this week, so you'd have uh, you know two opportunities. You did, yeah. I got two doses, right? <laughs> um, this, uh, Tom and Dave, asked most of my questions and I thank Dave for the question about executive compensation. I just wanted to follow up on that because um, that is excessively vague, all those words are, which Dave pointed out. And I just want to know who determines that, what these executives get paid because 
you know, they're in their six figures now, at least the top executives, and they've got a huge payroll. The second question I ask is, um, or is the phrase appropriate utilization. Again, what does that mean? Is that the fairly generic phrase too? And I think that's a lot of the problems I had with this budget presentation, and I echo the thoughts of everyone to the staff. They, I think they deserve a Medal of Honor for putting this together. But everything about One Care is so vague. And that's a big problem I have with it. <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you for your comments, and it's good to have you back. Um, I don't have the answers, and I don't endeavor to answer every question that's raised. I, I think, and one care can connect with you if they'd like, but I think the executive comp is determined by their board of managers, I think. Um, and perhaps the CEO has input as to folks below their level. I don't know that specifically sitting here right now, but that's my general gist is that the board of managers would determine the executive. Um, but thank you for the question and comment. Anyone else? Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone um, for the presentation today. Uh, and with that, I'll turn to whether or not there's any uh, old business to come before the board. Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.